hopefully might come up with some program in Bangladesh or Saudi also. Uh, Medtronic has agreed to uh, have some kind of financial assistance on this part. We have a well-trained uh, group of people who are ready to work uh, for our car, who are ready to come anywhere in the globe if you need it. We'll, we can do workshops on crystallization, we can do workshops on graph creation, we can do workshops on sen uh, cap lap equations and continuous motion. We can do the peripheral Doppler assessments, we can do the workshops on even on the peripheral ultrasound-based angioplasty, whatever abilities you want. I have the manpower and the abilities around us to, ha to showcase so that we move to the next level. So we remain, we don't remain stuck. It's just purely an education endeavor. This is uh, like Ganesha says, so it, it, it's an NGO which is doing all these jobs and which we are supported by pharmaceuticals and other people overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly rather. Thank you very much for being patient. Uh, the, the professor, Dr. M. D. Nijambuddin Chaudhary, is a renowned nephrologist from Hegel College with more than 20 years experience of, is now available in Square Hospital as a part-time consultant in nephrology. He achieved MBBS from Chidang Medical College, then started his career under the Ministry of Health. And after the working as a medical officer in different districts of Bangladesh for many years, he became the assistant minister of nephrology at BSTM in 1993 and he underwent the fellowship training in Toronto General Hospital, Canada, and became the ISN scholar on transplant nephrology. He also received the fellowship from the American Society of Nephrology, USA, and he completed the MD in nephrology and achieved MCPS in internal medicine, also obtained FRCP from the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons, Glasgow. He has gained all necessary experience and qualification for holding the position of the professor and head of the department of nephrology at Hakka Medical College since 2010 till now. Sir, please. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairperson and the organizer for inviting me and asking me to present this on this topic. My topic is women and kidney disease. Women tend to uh, face more specific challenges Linked to kidney disease, the risk of developing CKD is at least as high in women than in men and may even be higher. According to the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, the progression of chronic disease is slower in women than in men. Sufferers open do not experience symptoms even with as much as 90% loss of the kidney function. So the incidence of, of kidney disease in women, around 600,000 women die every year from chronic kidney disease, and approximately about uh, 195 million women worldwide have chronic kidney disease. And CKD is more common to develop in women than men, uh, with an average 14% of prevalence in women and 12% in men. These are some uh, statistical aspects of kidney diseases. And kidney diseases affect women differently. More common, it is more common in women. And pregnancy, there is risk of pregnancy. Higher rates of depression, more bone disease, higher caregiving burden, and donate more but transplant less. So they have the higher risk for lupus, urinary tract infection, 
and uh, some other rheumatological disease I will uh, uh, tell on this aspect later on and there is gender differences throughout the country. Among those autoimmune diseases like SLE, rheumatoid arthritis, and systemic sclerosis preferentially affect the women and are characterized by systemic inflammation leading to the target organ dysfunction, including the kidney. Sex differences in, in the incidence and severity of this disease result from complex interaction of hormone, genetic, and epigenic, epigenetic factors. Sex differences in the incidence and severity of autoimmune disease, male female ratio, like in SLE in reproductive age, is peak in 15 is to 1. And uh, other uh, diseases like influence of, there is influences of estrogen, this is very important. And uh, uh, around the perimenopausal um, period, the rheumatoid arthritis incidence is peak. And SLE, systemic lupus erythromatosis affects the pre in pregnancy effect on fertility. That is, fertility of SLE patients is usually unaltered. Factors lowering fertility as renal failure, cyclophosphamide use, and very active disease, antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, and high dose of steroid and NSAIDs. And fetal outcome following uh, some risk factors like abortion is 6 to 35 percent and stillbirth 4 to 22 percent with the risk of active lupus and previous history of fetal death and the presence of APLS. Intrauterine growth retardation is also higher incidence with a risk factor of hypertension, preeclampsia and use of steroid in case of female. And prematurity is like 40 to 50 percent due to the hypertension and preeclampsia and there are some other factors use of due, due to use of steroid there is PROM incidence also affects the female and other risk factors presence of risk factor uh, other risk factors maternal outcome are also affected like diabetes lupus nephritis hypertension toxemia in previous pregnancy and thrombocytopenia and APLS and affect the um, uh, by toxemia of pregnancy and due to steroid use as earlier I mentioned the hypertension, diabetes and infection also increase and the causes of maternal death also affected with severe renal flare, pulmonary hypertension, cardiomyopathy and pulmonary embolism health syndrome. And there are effects of pregnancy on SLE, like disease flare and permanent loss of renal function in a small proportion, although there is no change in the long term course. And during pregnancy, uh, it may happen flare at any trimester of pregnancy, also in postpartum period, commonly it is milder form and renal flare 40% during conception and there is incidence of also CNS invo involvement. Disease state during conception, more than six month full remission on hydroxychloroquine, 
chemotherapy, plus minus prednisolone and azathiapine. Uh, no use of cyclophosphamide and MTS MMF, higher dose of prednisolone and NSH should be avoided. A follow up schedule should be monthly up to 12, 28 weeks, fortnightly 28 to 32 weeks and then thereafter weekly. More open in patients with active disease, the follow up schedule should be maintained. And treatment during pregnancy, patients and family education and counseling and drugs like folic acid, hydroxychloroquine, aspirin. Um, needs to be used and flare prophylaxis with universal use of low dose prednisolone throughout the pregnancy, low molecular heparin in case of antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. And in case of flare, uh, prednisolone should be used in 1 milligram per kg body weight and may be preceded by pulse methyl prednisolone and azathioprine and cyclosporine. Another uh, challenges for the women are urinary tract infection. Prevalence is about 40 to 50 percent in women and uh, than in men and 10 percent in women have the recurrent UTI in their life and 7 million new cases of lower urinary tract per year. And there are some specific etiology also and risk factors for the um, uh, urinary tract infection in women. They are more the the lining and eighty percent of the UTI due to the Treatment from male, so a short course of into five days. An imaging study only complicated and recurrent urinary tract infection. Most common in pregnant women. It has because it has clinical consequences. Uh, both the sequencing and the treatment of this condition are indicated. And asymptomatic bacteria during pregnancy is associated with preterm birth and perinatal mortality of the for the fetus and pyelonephritis for the mother. And it increases because of difficult hygiene in an immunocompromised situation and hormonal and mechanical changes and there may be glycosuria due to the impaired reabsorption resorption by the collecting tubules and loop of Henle and amino acid urea that affect the adherence of the Escherichia coli to the urethelium. So I am not going in details of the management but <coughs> short course of antibiotic may be needed in especially in asymptomatic bacteria and as all of you know, there are some physiological changes in normal pregnancy, especially there is uh, changes in glomerular hemodynamics like vasodilatation, increase in renal plasma flow and GFR and also there is some changes in tubular functions and electrolyte balance. Especially some biochemical changes like in creatinine, uric acid. Uh, there is some changes in uh, during pregnancy. Another important aspect is hypertension in pregnancy. Hypertension in pregnancy, blood pressure more, th uh, more than or equal 140, 90 millimeter of mercury. It may be gestational hypertension, which may be transient gestational, and it may be preeclampsia or chronic hypertension. Preeclampsia plus seizure when Preeclampsia is associated with seizure, we call it eclampsia, affects the pregnant women after 20 weeks of gestation and up to 6 weeks after delivery, new onset hypertension and proteinuria, marker of kidney damage, damage to the other organ and symptoms can be mild or life threatening. And renal abnormality in preeclampsia, there is proteinuria and endotheliosis, decreased GFR, decreased Prostacyclin production, decreased renin secretion 
and increase uric acid reabsorption and decrease renal blood flow and increase sodium reabsorption. So, these changes occurs in uh, preeclampsia and primary manifestations is hypertension, renal involvement like proteinuria and hematological changes and some liver dysfunction and some neurological and other major organ dysfunction. And in management, most important is clinical assessment, then uh, control of blood pressure with uh, uh, and patient needs to admit um, uh, expectant in patient management BP control and magnesium sulfate use of magnesium sulfate for prophylaxis platelet infusion if needed and indication of delivery is uncontrolled hypertension worsening renal and hepatic functions or thrombocytopenia health syndrome eclampsia pulmonary edema and severe fetal growth restriction and fetal uh, decline like abnormal Doppler. Antihypertensive medications, first line antihypertensive medications as you know that hydrolazin, levitalol and nifedipine and in chronic hypertension also you can start with methyl dopa and clonidine and other group of antihypertensive drugs. Long term consequence of preeclampsia, after preeclampsia there is a long term increased likelihood of a fetal and non-fetal uh, coronary disease, cerebrovascular accident, hypertension, thromboembolism, end-stage kidney disease, diabetes, and even death. And another important issue is pregnancy-related AKI. 15.3 percent of the pregnant women, women hospitalized with preeclampsia had acute kidney injury. There is risk of metal death and stillbirth. Pregnancy related AKI is AKI occurring during pregnancy, labor, de delivery and postpartum period. The two categories uh, are pregnancy specific and pregnancy non-specific AKI may happen. A significant problem in developing world accounts for up to 20 percent of all AKI, usually in unsafe termination. In developed world, the preeclampsia is the commonest cause. So, the in terms of uh, pregnancy related AKI, it differs between the developed and underdeveloped uh, developing nations. Pregnancy and AKI and in prerenal, there are prerenal causes of uh, as we know that pregnancy and AKI happens in prerenal like antepartum and postpartum hemorrhage hyperemesis gravidarum, sepsis, which is the most common cause and in uh, renal causes acute tubular necrosis, pyelonephritis, cortical necrosis and thrombotic microangiopathy, preeclampsia health syndrome and obstruction is the post cause of pregnancy related AKI. And another aspect is pregnancy and chronic kidney disease. In chronic kidney disease, uh, there is lots of changes following pregnancy, hypothalamic changes there is decreased threshold for vasopressin release and systemic changes decreased sensitivity to drugs and water increased water retention and plasma scolarity also re reduced and there is derangement in uh, blood flow and GFR. So, in maternal uh, renal outcome according to the pre-pregnancy serum creatinine, this is very important and when serum creatinine is less than 1.5 milligram per deciliter, permanent loss of GFR in less than 10 percent women and there is greatest risk of GFR decline less than 40 percent, 40 ml per minute and proteinuria when is more than 1 gram per day. Major determinant of ESRD progression in hypertension is hypertension and 40 percent risk of Eclampsia is based baseline protein if baseline protein is more than 500 milligram per day, and if serum creatinine is 1.5 to 2.5 milligram per deciliter, there is decline or permanent loss of GFR in 30 percent of the women, and increase to 50 percent is there is uncontrolled hypertension, and 10 percent of the patient uh, develop ESRD soon after pregnancy, and danger is when 
um, patient uh, lady become pregnant when serum creatinine is more than 2.5 milligram per deciliter there is progression to esrd highly likely during or soon after pregnancy so there is also impact of on fetus and maternal according to the maternal pre pregnancy serum creatinine out outcomes after according accounting for first trimester miscarriage serum creatinine if less than 1.5 mg per deciliter is still but is nine in 90% of the women and up to 50% preterm delivery 60% small for gestational age is if proteinuria is more than 500 mg per deciliter and there is high chance of fetal loss uh, when creatinine is more than 2.5 mg per deciliter so maternal uh, pre pregnancy counseling is important for those women maternal risk is there is accelerated decline in gfr sometimes precipitating dialysis during the pregnancy or soon after uh, severe maternal hypertension with a risk of a stroke and superimposed preeclampsia with renal hepatic and thrombotic or bleeding or neurogenic risk and there is risk of nephrotic syndrome with thrombosis and sepsis and iron or vitamin d deficiency and in terms of fetal risk fetal growth restriction and intrauterine fetal death this should be explained with the patient and dialysis should be intensified if um, um, uh, if uh, any uh, pregnant lady with severe renal failure or there is uh, um, uh, serum creatinine is less than 2.5 20 hours per week in uh, four or more sessions aim for pre dialysis burn less than 40 and heparin requirement may increase because of hypercoagulity of the pregnancy anemia should be corrected with iron and esa uh, should be uh, uh, dose of esa should be increased to achieve hemoglobin 10 to 11 gram per deciliter and use of oral or dialysis bicarbonate to achieve normal bicarbonate level 18 to 22 millimole per liter and nutritional advice ser serum calcium and phosphate should be optimized level should be maintained and women with chronic kidney disease should be managed by a team comprising of a statistician nephrologist and uh, experienced midwife or a special nurse and ICU specialist sometimes ICU may needed maybe um, um, a patient may need ICU support main determination determinants of pregnancy outcome are pre pregnancy GFR proteinuria and blood pressure this should be focused in uh, focus in counseling and low dose of aspirin is helpful and uh, in managing women with pre existing renal disease during pregnancy The first successful pregnancy, uh, uh, then the topic uh, issue is the pregnancy and transplantation. The first su successful pregnancy in kidney transplant recipients occurred in 1958 to 23-year-old uh, Edith Helm, and who received a kidney from her identical twin sister in 1956. She delivered a healthy full-term boy of 3,300 grams by cesarean section. Since then. There have been many successful pregnancies in uh, kidney transplant recipients. Maternal and fetal outcome in renal transplant patient, uh, renal transplant pregnancies, the long-term decline in glomerular filtration rate if preconception serum creatinine is 1.4 milligram or below. So serum creatinine, if higher, there is chance of complications. Um, uh, that is, there is chance of decline in GFR and also graft loss 5 to 10 percent in two years post form. There is hypertension, chance of hypertension, rejection, infection and gestational diabetes. For the fetus also there are some complications like spontaneous miscarriage and prematurity, fetal growth retardation. And so the predictor of pregnancy outcome is risk factors described in association with poor pregnancy outcome are hypertension, elevated pregnancy creatinine proteinuria and history of more than two renal transplant. So recommendation of the American Society of Transplantation to follow uh, before conception 
no rejection in previous years and adequate and stable renal function, no acute phytotoxic infections like CMB, stable kidney function with non-teratogenic maintenance immunosuppression and additional factors to it which should be taken into consideration like rejection within the first year, maternal age, comorbidity and the drugs, common commonly used immunosuppression drugs are prednisolone, azathioprine, tactolimus and cyclosporine and uh, drugs should be stopped before, before pregnancy are MMF and serolimus, evarolimus and um, breastfeeding Transplant uh, recipient taking prednisolone, azathioprine, cyclosporine, tactolimus should not be discouraged pro from breastfeeding. It is well established now that the infant who are breastfed by mothers on prednisolone, azathioprine, cyclosporine, tactolimus have a lesser exposure via breast milk than in utero and they do not have adverse effects. So, clinical information on breastfeeding is inadequate for MMF and serolimus, severolimus and balatacep and breastfeeding should be avoided in those cases. And pregnancy complication in kidney donors. The exponential global rise in living donor kidney transplant has led to an increasing number of pregnant women who have donated a kidney. In view of rigorous screening before donation for risk factors for future renal disease which also are associated with adverse pregnancy outcome like hypertension, obesity and diabetes. It might be expected that women who have donated a kidney should have minimal complication. So, current literature is limited. Uh, rates of preeclampsia higher in pregnancy after donation than pregnancy before donation 5.5 percent versus 0.8 percent. So, rates of gestational hypertension also were higher in kidney donors than control. The rates of fetal loss in pregnancy after donation compared with, the, uh, with those before donation. So, uh, there are some literature review the regarding the gender and the chronic kidney disease. I am not going details. Uh, so, in summary, lady, Mr. Chairpersons and ladies and gentlemen, Given the data presented above with respect to pregnancy, AKI, autoimmune disease, CKD, dialysis and transplantation, there are many unanswered questions. In high income countries with increased maternal age and assisted fertilization, there may be an increase in preeclampsia, which is impact, which may Im impact future generation if associated with adverse fetal outcome. And women have unique risk of kidney risk for kidney disease as well as the issues related to access to care and have a profound impact on both the current and next generation and uh, advocating for improved access to care for women is critical to maintain the health of families, communities and population. So, that is all about my presentation. Thank you all. Thank you for patient sharing. Dr. Muhammad Abdul Rahim graduated from the Sarsolimullah Medical College, Dhaka, on 2001. After the completion of internship in Mitford Hospital, he joined the emergency medical officer with the burden in 2003. He obtained the FCPS medicine, Bangladesh uh, BCPS, uh, in 2010. At, and at present, he is serving the assistant professor in the department of nephrology. Uh, he has uh, over uh, 100 publications in national and international journal and currently working as a co-guide in six dissertation under BCPS. He received the best presenter award in three paper sessions in annual conference association of ABP and Bangladesh Society of Medicine. Uh, the
uh, he uh, is a member of ASN and uh, also the EADA members and the SCP members. So I'm requesting to Dr. Rahim deliver his speech. Thank you. Thank, thank you, sir, for kind introduction. Respected teachers, chairpersons, learned audience, assalamu alaikum. The topic of my presentation is air pollution and kidney disease. I would like to uh, express my gratitude to the organizing committee for inviting me to talk on this relatively unexplored area. First of all, we should uh, think about the changing global pattern. Overall, the infections are being less common. Some infections are eradicated and some are on way of eradication. But newer infections are emerging and some infections are re-emerging like tuberculosis because of immune suppression and HIV and AIDS. Overall, infections are being contained, but non-communicable diseases are increasing. We can see the global prevalence of chronic kidney disease is around 12%. And kidney diseases are not among the top four non-communicable diseases, but it is the fastest growing one. You can see that this increasing prevalence uh, of kidney disease is not sufficiently explained by the traditional drivers like diabetes and hypertension. So there are search in uh, for such unconventional or emerging risk factors. And in the United States, about 13% of the CKD cases are attributed to air pollution. So air uh, kidney diseases are on rise, and it has changed its position from 32nd in 1990 to 10th in 2018. Uh, this is a common photograph which we can face day to day in our Dhaka lives. Air pollution. Air pollution is a mixture of gaseous components and solid and liquid particles suspended in the air beyond the recommended concentration with some health hazards. The air pollution varies substantially in chemical composition in different countries, in different cities, even within the same city in different parts. The constituents are particulate matters, heavy metals, smoke, and other gaseous components. According to uh, World Air Quality Report, Bangladesh remains at the top of particulate matter concentration. If we consider the capital cities, Delhi was top. But for the last few weeks, if you are aware, I wish, I believe you all are Dhaka top the rank. So health effects of air pollution, it is known for long. It was thought in the prehistoric era even that ill health is due to ill air. But from uh, 1900th century, after industrialization in the Europe and UK, we have definite scientific data in favor of air pollution and its adverse health effects because of respiratory illness and increased mortality. And over the previous century, we have learned about adverse effects of air pollution on hypertension, impaired glucose tolerance and diabetes, cancers, and congenital malformations. But the job of today's, my job is to answer two questions. Is air pollution a risk factor for kidney disease? And if the answer is yes, how? In 2018, there are two landmark reviews. First one was published in Nature Reviews Nephrology by Jinju and his colleagues, and second one in Clinical Kidney Journal uh, by Boris Afsar and his European colleagues. The second one was a robust one. It reviewed over 30 years publications in all the international and peer-reviewed journal websites, and the keywords they used not to left any stone unturned to link between pollution and kidney diseases. After this publication, ERA EDTA on their website published a news that yes, air pollution can cause kidney disease. How? After entering into the lungs, the pollutants, uh, some directly, microparticles directly enter into the circulation, but others are engulfed by mic macrophage. There is inflammatory mediator release and some metabolites, uh, they try to metabolize or neutralize the uh, infectants, pollutants. Some are toxic. So there is chance that these inflammatory mediators released in response to air pollution, the toxic metabolites, and directly entering particles go into the systemic circulation, 
and kidney receive 20 to 25 percent of the cardiac output. So there is every chance that these particles get lost into the kidney cells and cause kidney damage. Such way, in the same way, they can affect every organ in the body. There is chance of air pollution causes autonomic nervous system activation and hypertension. Patients who live in areas of high concentration of particulate matter has high white cell count, high fibrinogen level. There are inflammatory responses, endothelial dysfunction, and vascular stasis. There is oxidative stress, high blood pressure, and loss of dipping of the nighttime blood pressure. Plasma viscosity is increased. There is increased chance of diabetes and insulin resistance. All together can cause vascular changes, intraglomerular hypertension, there is glomerular sclerosis, and tubular interstitial damage. All these things together can lead to kidney damage as well as other internal organ damage. This table shows some constituents of the air pollutant and their sources. Now, specifically, I would uh, uh, go for some particulate matters. These are the matters which come as a result of combustion of the diesel, uh, gasoline, and other household burns. Increased con particulate matter above recommended dose has been linked to low GFR, CKD, CKD progression, and ESRD. In a Chinese study, over 2,000 kidney biopsy samples, it was seen that after adjusting the age, gender, and BMI, and other characteristics, particulate matter concentration above 70 was associated with membranous nephropathy. Heavy metals? Heavy metals can cause kidney damage. It is well known. But it is not known that heavy metals are constituents of the air pollution. Cadmium is rich in smoking. Smokers are exposed to cadmium, and cadmium con can cause kidney damage. But others, like lead, mercury, arsenic, these are mostly come. These mostly come from mining and industry. They can cause oxidative stress, impaired DNA, DNA impair, antioxidant ability, and cellular apoptosis. The histological markers are proximal tubular dysfunction that can lead to glycosuria, amino aciduria, Fanconi syndrome-like pictures, and cellular apoptosis. Smoking, I have already said that smoking is a good source of cadmium for smokers. But smoking overall has been linked to incident CKD, CKD progression, and ESRD. We know smoking can cause endothelial dysfunction, hypertension, dyslipidemia, and the inflammatory markers like CRP and endothelial dysfunction is much more among the smokers. In a small study in the USA, it was seen that smoking is related to nephrotic range proteinuria even in children who are passive smokers, not current smokers. Other gases, these are mostly resultant from the combustion of the diesel and uh, other uh, motor vehicles. These are associated with hypertension, prehypertension, CKD, low GFR, ESR, and CKD-related mortality. CKD of unknown origin has emerged over the last 20 to 30 years, especially from Sri Lanka, India, Egypt, and Central Africa among young farmers. The cause of this CKD is not well known, but maternal malnutrition, nephron underdosing under are popular theories, but glycos uh, glyphosate, an important constituent of the uh, pesticides, has been linked to development of CKD of unknown etiology. Malignancy, smoking is related to renal cell carcinoma, and aniline dyes are associated with urogenital malignancy, but other uh, risk factors of air, other factors of air pollution are not so much convincing. So far, I have said the evidences are mostly epidemiological and observational ones. Dose-response relationship has not been fully established with all these air pollutants to the kidney disease. Longitudinal and prospective cohort studies are limited, but some are ongoing. Probably they will give the answer. So the concern is at our individual level, hi, how I am, am I uh, be infected, what I can do for prevention, what m our countries, like developing countries, because they are mostly contributing to the air pollution, and globally what can be done. This is uh, a very uh, known to us, Delhi. It was another top polluted city in the world. So the go global political leaders are trying 
and they are doing their best. But this year, the UN Youth Climate Summit happened, and they weren't in their declaration that they, the youth, will be watching what the global leaders are doing. And the this is the roadmap what the global leaders will be doing. The ultimate uh, need is that to raise awareness among policymakers, industry representatives, and public, especially in developing countries like ours. There is need for establishing and strictly reinforcing the air quality standards, mandating vehicle and industrial emission control, adopting policies against heavily polluted industries, promoting the use of greener energy and public transportation, and prioritizing clinical and healthcare research into the effects of these pollutants. If these steps are met, definitely we'll be expecting a green life, healthy lifestyle, and healthier people. In summary, Mr. Chairman, I can say that non-communicable diseases are increasing and kidney diseases are the first, thing gro first growing contributor to this. Air pollution is a risk factor for kidney diseases. Inflammatory mediators, toxic metabolites, and some unknown mechanisms are playing their role. And improved air quality will give us a better life, better healthier life, and better kidneys. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Abdurrahim. Uh, we are not inviting any question because of constraint of time, because we have three more sessions before lunch after that. So thank you, thank you Dr. Abdurrahim. I think we need to conclude here our this session, and uh, the next uh, symposium will start soon.
কিন্তু আসলে বিদেশীদের কিছু অ্যাকোমোডেট জন্য আমরা একটু প্রোগ্রামগুলো নতুন করে সাজাতে হয়েছে আশা করি আপনারা কিছু মনে করবেন না
uh, the incidence is that it decreased, but the prevalence is still high. Uh, on 1st March 1995, Taiwan formed a national health insurance model following the passage of national health insurance. Uh, the health insurance covered 99% of people in the island. However, the money, uh, the budget is limited. You can see the uh, healthy budget uh, increased just uh, uh, 2 to 5 percent, but the dialysis cost increased at least 10 percent. So how to decrease the uh, renal failure and the dialysis patient? Uh, in the morning, uh, some uh, speaker say renal transplant is definitely treatment uh, to uh, end stage renal disease. That's, that's a good answer uh, because uh, it's a good choice because of the low cost and the benefit. In Taiwan, a uh, renal transplant patient can survive 95 percent, five, five years survival. But in the dialysis patient, with every effort of every physician, the dialysis uh, survival rate is around 55 to 90, uh, 60 percent. Uh, even uh, the blood type mismatch and the HLA incompatible renal transplant has better survival rate compared with the waiting list or transplant control group and the waiting list only control group. It's a good choice. In Taiwan, uh, kidney transplant is much rarer than kidney dialysis. Uh, most of the end stage renal disease receive hemodialysis up to 90%. Only 9% uh, uh, receive the peritoneal dialysis, and uh, uh, very, uh, very rare patients receive the uh, kidney transplant. Uh, Taiwan is an open, com open community, so every information is open. Uh, Taiwan Organ Registry, Registry and Share Center show the data. Uh, 2019, uh, we have uh, around 8,000 end stage renal disease on the waiting list, but only 216 uh, patients receive renal transplant. So, uh, we love, uh, we all, uh, we, we love uh, my home dance, so we want to uh, stop the, sub the subject. What is already know about this topic, disparity in kidney transplant? A potential barrier uh, around the pathway to renal transplant are apparent, apparent in several countries. Uh, tr transplant rate uh, vary across individual and neighborhood social economic factors. Solution on the, to the renal transplant are associated with health uh, status and social economic factors. Individual social economic status. Rich people get more and the poor people get less. Uh, the gap in Taiwan between the rich and poor has widely rapidly. Taiwan ranking uh, fifth uh, uh, in the fifteenth. Uh, in war for actual rich people, the GDP has increased to uh, 25,000 US dollars. However, still the local homeless people line up for free food outside the Grace Home Church in Taipei. They are also a uh, geographic uh, social economic status different. Uh, there are some area and some bad area. Uh, even we have uh, one healthcare system in the small island. Uh, we talk about the combined effect of individual neighborhood uh, social economic status on renal transplant. Uh, we designed a cohort study and the setting uh, national health insurance uh, data. Uh, the study outcome is analyze the effect uh, on transplant survival rate and uh, uh, renal transplant rate. 
the individual and the neighborhood SES is based on income uh, related insurance payment amount and the uh, uh, residents in advantage area and this uh, advantage area. The result, we include uh, 57,000 people. Uh, in our data, uh, high SES patients living in advantage neighborhood had a more chance to receive renal transplant. Uh, uh, after 10 years, uh, they near a uh, 50% patient uh, got the trans transplant. But in low individual and uh, disadvantaged neighborhood, it's around 5% uh, We analyzed the data. Uh, it shows the uh, uh, rich people uh, two times uh, ch chance to get the transplant. Uh, because uh, we have uh, 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 the, the graph that is from uh, maybe uh, in, in Taiwan or from the uh, overseas, uh, means the some, some patient uh, pay money to get the kidney. That's the so-called uh, graph uh, kidney tourism. Uh, from this data, we can see the overseas the renal transplant, uh, the rich people has more chance to get a uh, uh, renal transplant. Oh, okay. Uh, but the poor people, uh, but in in the in the domestic area, we can see the incident, uh, the the other ratio decrease. After a, uh, analysis the uh, uh, domestic kidney transplant, uh, we can see the death. The death rate is similar. Uh, it means that uh, within the health single health care system, uh, rich people and poor people is no different. But uh, the the rich people still has some uh, minimal advantage uh, to keep the kidney survival. Uh, this is a simple conclusion. Uh, uh, first, in Taiwan, a major disparity exists in access to renal transplant, including domestic and uh, overseas. The in inequality in access to the renal transplant in Taiwan are associated with the e socioeconomic, demographic, uh, geographic factor. The in inequality in in the access to the domestic renal transplant could be due to the some barrier in registration process. So, uh, uh, I think uh, if I input the barrier, uh, we can get the equal chance. Uh, the equal, equal e equality of survival in domestic renal transplant could be achieved by single uh, care system, Taiwan health care system. I, I, I think the other uh, inequality to be reduced uh, by uh, some barrier. Why would choose uh, the topic? Uh, because uh, I we check the way here. We check. We see the GK Hospital is the first uh, hospital in independent Bangladesh, and it doesn't uh, provide treatment service only, but it also work on uh, public health and uh, education. I think uh, it, it can be the, the Bangladesh uh, largest. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chen. Thank you all. Thank you. Now I'd like to uh, ask our second speaker, Fu Chen Lu, professor of Fujian Catholic University Hospital and president of Taiwan Society of Nephrology. Dr. Sir Lu would uh, speak on vitamin D and inner in secondary hyperparathyroidism. Professor Lu, please. 
Thank you, Professor Chair, and uh, good afternoon. I'm Dr. Lu from Taiwan. Now I will talk about the vitamin D and the calcium magnetic in SHPT. As we know, in CKD patients, retention of phosphate increase FGF23 and the decrease active and the negative vitamin D induce increased PTH levels. Increased FGF and the PTH can increase the urine excretion of phosphate. However, in the parasite gram, FGF23 can increase the 1-alpha hydroxylase enzyme activity in the parasite gram. Also, in the renal proximal tubular, FGF can decrease the phosphor phosphate reabsorption, but uh, it can increase the sodium and the calcium reabsorption in the distal renal tubular, which may contribute to the volume overload and the vascular calcification. In addition to FGF act on the kidney, it can also induce systemic inflammation and uh, increase the hepcidine, which may induce a uh, iron resistance anemia. Another factor contribute to the high PTH levels in CKD is the metabolic estosis. In CKD patients, by coming infusion to correct estosis, we can see here it can also decrease the PTH levels because increase of serum hydrogen concentration in terms of metabolic stosis can change the calcium sensing receptor structure. With this change, the calcium sensing receptor may present with less sensitive to extracellular calcium. Similar situation is the serum phosphate. Increased serum phosphate can also change the structure of the calcium sensing receptor. Thus, the high phosphate can inactivation of calcium sensing receptor, which may induce a high PTH levels. So we summarize many factors causing the high PTH in CKD. In addition to the increased hydrogen and the increased phosphate can reduce the calcium sensing receptor sensitivity to the extracellular calcium because in parasitic gram cell it has its own one alpha hydroxylase if we provide adequate nutritional vitamin d this vitamin d can move into the parasitic gram cell it can produce active vitamin d intragram, which also may contribute to control of PTH synthesis and the secretion. The latest critical guidelines show in patients with CKD, if patients present with progressive increase of serum PTH levels, we show management by evaluating the modifiable factors such as vitamin D deficiency. Because vitamin D is a sunshine vitamin D, we can synthesize the low material of active form vitamin D, the colic from skin. After liver and the kidney action, we would like to have active form 125 vitamin D. Now we are focused on the negative of nutritional vitamin D, the colic In CKD patients, lower serum 25 vitamin D may have higher serum PTH levels. It means lower nutritional D may have higher PTH levels in CKD patients. Usually, we use calcitriol, means the active form vitamin D to treat SHPT. However, calcitriol can also influence the bone through decrease the monocyte differentiation and the proliferation into the mature osteoclast. Simplify the cassie trial can suppress the differentiation and the maturation of osteoclast. For the mature osteoclast, our study also showed pharmacology dose of active vitamin D can suppress the osteoclast. 
suppress osteoclast means in PT in patients with high PTH levels, suppress osteoclast can decrease the release calcium and the phosphate from the bone. However, the osteoclast can also synthesize the win TMB, a win protein, which is important and essential for the osteoblast maturation and the proliferation. Casey trial treated osteoblast also synthesis the win 5 a So, short-term use of active vitamin D in CKD, it can suppress the, the osteoclast. It means decrease bone resorption. It also can increase the osteoclast synthesis, the win 10 b and the osteoblast synthesis, the win 5 a which may contribute to the increased maturation and uh, differentiation of the osteoblast in terms of increased bone formation. So short-term use of active vitamin D can increase your bone mass. However, long-term use of active vitamin D can decrease the osteoblast and the osteoclast viability. In addition to long-term use of active D may suppress bone turnover. It also can induce vascular calcification. Even the vitamin D receptor was knocked out because active vitamin D can increase the calcium and the phosphate absorption from the GI tract. On the contrary, nutritional D such as 25 vitamin D or cholecalciferol can prevent the vascular calcification development because adequate nutritional D can suppress the glial one positive stem cell. Because glial one positive stem cell is very important for the vascular smooth muscle trans differentiation into the osteoblast neck cell. So nutritional D should be given as early, early as possible. So for CKD patients with SHPD, Usually, we use the active form vitamin D, but we should always keep in mind, we should avoid excess use of active form D and uh, ensure we should repress the vitamin D deficiency, especially with nutritional D. We also should avoid hypercalcemia and uh, hyperphosphatemia. In CKD patients, we can see here, supplement with nutritional D, the patients may not develop uh, high PTH. So early use of nutritional D can prevent CKD patient develop uh, high PTH levels. In high PTH levels disease, such uh, as SHPD and adenoma, the paracelogram may have higher one alpha hydroxylase enzyme. It means the paracelogram can have a higher capability and a higher ability to synthesis intragram active form vitamin D. If you give the patients low material, the nutritional D, because nutritional D will not increase absorption of calcium and the phosphate from the GI tract. The paracelogram also has less 24 hydroxylase, the major enzyme responsible for the catabolism of vitamin D. So in high PTH patients, the patients stay in a vitamin D hunger state. In paracelogram cell, using the synacalcy can also increase the 1-alpha hydroxylase enzyme activity by 50%. So high PTH status can increase the 1-alpha hydroxylase. Using of synacalcy may further increase the 1-alpha hydroxylase. So in paracelogram, the patients with SHPD, patient may show in a vitamin D hunger state. If we give the nutritional D, thus we can increase the serum 25D. 25 vitamin D enter into the paracelogram cell. Intragram can produce more 125 vitamin D, which can efficiently to suppress the PTH levels, but it without any influence on the serum calcium and the phosphate. In HD patients with moderate hyperpower, Active and uh, nutritional vitamin D can decrease the PTH more efficiently. 
how about the calcium magnetic? There are two types of calcium magnetics. Type one act on the intramembrane domain of the calcium sensing receptor. The, however, the new calcium magnetic IV bone ethylcastide act direct on the calcium sensing receptor. Because after lunch, the synaptic calcium, even with the similar PTH levels, using of synaptic calcium can decrease the hip fracture in dialysis patients. It can also decrease the parasitectomy number. It was study why using the ITT analysis also showed calcium magnetic can decrease the CV event and the hip, non-hip, and the all side bony fracture. I even in severe hyperpara, combination of synacalcy, calcium trial, and the nutritional vitamin D can early and uh, more infections decrease of PTH levels. However, synacalcy may influence the cyclochrome P450. So DDI is a big problem. For the DDI, the second generation ethylcastai was launched because it consists of, of eight amino acids, but not influence other drug metabolism. Compared to synacalcy, ethylcastai also show non inferior to traditional synacalcy. However, it still show the similar GI side effect. So to overcome the GI side effect, the newly developed calcium magnetic, the evo also was launched. It shows same efficacy as synacalcy, but it has less GI effect and less DDI. evo when compared to the synacalcy, also show the similar effect on decrease of PTH levels, but it can decrease GI side effect. Because synacalcy, even in the high PTH level, calcium magnetic can increase the osteoblast, the osteoclast, and the bone formation from the bone biopsy findings. So similar decrease the PTH with synacalcy of active vitamin D. However, calcium magnetic can also direct act on the bone cell. Here we can see synacalcy can decrease the osteoclast viability. So it can decrease bone release of calcium and the phosphate into the circulation. Osteoclast can also synthesize wind tempi. be Wind tempi be can also promote the osteoblast proceed bone mineralization. And uh, the bone tropical, tropical bone can increase and the cortical bone can more sickness and uh, less cortical porosity. So in SHPD patients, synacalcy can decrease the osteoclast viability, but osteoclast can synthesis and the secretion of wind can be to promote the osteoblast viability and the differentiation. So we may have good improve in bone quality and the quantity. Even synacalcy has a dose-dependent improved renal fibrosis in CKD MPT mice. So the new generation of the calcium magnetic, such as evocalcy, I think it's efficacy on PTH suppression, but improve side effect when compared with the traditional calcium magnetic drug. For nutritional D, because Panasarogram of SHPT patients may have one alpha hydroxylase activity and the less 24 hydroxylase activity. So nutritional decombination with traditional SHPT syrup may provide more efficient decrease in PTH and the decrease the dosage of active form vitamin D. It can also synergistic action with the calcium magnetic. It can also improve bone health because less bone resorption and the more bone formation. So more calcium and the phosphate can enter into the bone. Thus, we may have uh, less muscular calcification. 
Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Liu, for very beautiful presentation. Now, please accept one question, one listening question. Is it there, Sam? Thank you. Good luck to Professor. Dr. Abu Hassan Muhammad Bashar, Ashok Prakasad, Department of Vascular Surgery, NIC Delhi, Hyderabad. And I will be presenting on vascular access complication and its management. Dr. Bashar, please. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. Uh, Honorable Chairperson, my <coughs> respected teachers, uh, dear friends and colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon, assalamu alaikum. Uh, uh, before I begin, I'd like to uh, thank the organizing committee and uh, Professor Dr. Mahmoud Mustafi sir in particular uh, for inviting me here. I remember being in conferences uh, practically all over the world, but probably this is the first time I have been asked to present before a gathering of nephrologists and that I find very important because the topic that I'll be taking up is uh, immensely important not only to the nephrologists but also to the vascular surgeons. I work at the National Institute of Cardiovascular Surgery, uh, Cardiovascular Diseases uh, at the Sheru Bangla Nagar, uh, you might know the hospital and uh <coughs> it's the uh, one place where we do take care of all the vascular emergencies that take place in the uh, country and practically uh, from every corner of the country all sort of vascular emergencies turn up to the NICVD and uh, our emergencies do include uh, many uh, renal patients who have their uh, vascular complications and we do take care of that. But before I go into this science I uh, take this opportunity to uh, take a little humanitarian detour in the sense that uh, this is something I thought that I should be mentioning. As I was entering the auditorium in the morning, the name of the auditorium uh, drew my attention. It is dedicated in the name of uh, a Major ATM Haider, uh, whom you know uh, was a valiant freedom fighter. And I took a photograph and sent the photograph to USA, to Viber, uh, to Captain Sitara Birpatik. I think you know her very well. He, she now lives in America. And the reason I did that is that uh, mm, her husband, Dr. M. Abidur Rahman, is a very renowned vascular surgeon working in the United States. And he is the person who visits Bangladesh every year and works with us, the vascular surgeons of Bangladesh, and uh, does the mentoring. And he has been doing it uh, probably since 2009. So he has been one inspiration for us, the vascular surgeons of the country. So I think uh, this uh, respect that is being shown to a valiant freedom fighter of this country uh, is quite amazing and uh, something that we should all be proud of. Uh, back to the science, you know, I mean, uh, uh, the nephrologists and the vascular surgeons need to work hand in hand in taking care of the vascular aspect of the renal care that I I believe uh, all of us do agree. The thing is, uh, uh, vascular access complications are not really that rare, and 10 to 15 percent of the patients, as I mentioned here, uh, those who uh, are having the maintenance hemodialysis do present with different types of vascular complications. In Bangladesh, the problem is that, I mean, uh, we do work together, the nephrologists and the vascular surgeons, but on occasions, there are some gaps in communication that push the patients into difficulty. We are in a unique situation in the sense that our patients are poor, basically. And uh, now, and uh, the patient burden is quite huge, and the families who 
must take care of these patients are really caught uh, in a very dangerous situation. I mean, they, they are not really decided as to what to do. Uh, the continued treatment at the expense of the uh, huge financial burden that is placed on the whole family or to just uh, leave them alone and uh, just see the, uh, their relatives suffer like that. It's a, it's a very delicate situation. And our vascular surgeons, I mean, we, of course, we want to help them. We do help them. But the thing is, uh, our association with the patients is just probably very minimal. I mean, just we do uh, take care of them just once or twice. Most of the time, they will be with the nephrologist. But when they come to us, we have to hear this same story that these are very depleted patients because they have to continue dialysis and all other uh, routines that they need to. And uh, when they come to us, we have to have this sorry story that, okay, these patients are poor and need to be addressed accordingly. So we, uh, the purpose of, uh, for me being here is to share our vascular surgeon's perspective. We have here, you've heard a lot about the renal, uh, the nephrologist's perspective of renal care. Now, this is one exception uh, that I'll try to give you a vascular surgeon's perspective as to how uh, we face these patients and uh, do our uh, uh, our our services with this group of patients. Okay, these are the kind of uh, we begin with creation of fistula. Then, of course, I'll be coming I'll be coming to the complications. So these are the uh, different types of fistula that we create. First of all, we are given the responsibility of creating fistula. That is the basic job we do. So uh, the radiocephalic fistulas are the most common things we do. Brachiocephalic, the the transposition. Then we do the graft fistulas, of course, and there are the central venous lines that we, the vascular surgeons, do not do very often, but we do get to see them very often uh, due to a lot of reasons. And as uh, it is mentioned here, the catheters, they are uh, associated with a very high rate, pretty high rate of complications. So these are the various types of um, uh, fistulas that we create. Uh, the radiocephalic, the brachiocephalic, and now the uh, brachiobasilic transpositions, and the, uh, uh, I mean, the graft fistulas. And we do the, uh, you know, the maturation things. I mean, this is very important because uh, uh, the nephrologists also ask uh, the vascular surgeons or the, uh, or the people who have some knowledge on the Doppler principles as to how or uh, when the fistulas are matured enough for use. So there is a very clear-cut, I mean, uh, volumetric data that are available, and in, in expert hand, it is really possible to give them that data as to when the fistulas are matured enough for use. So this is, see, you can see the volume flow here. It has to be in excess of 400 milliliter per minute uh, for a fistula to be called matured. Uh, it has to be, ha I mean, uh, it is desirable that it has a diameter of about six millimeters and it has a depth less than six millimeter from the skin as well. So these are the basic things that uh, need to be achieved before uh, dialysis can be started. So now I begin with the complications. So what is the, what is the most dreaded complication? Of course, I mean, uh, we have, I'll, I'll come to that. There's, there's so many of them, but a failed fistula can be really a very bad type of complication. I call it the biggest complication the primary failure or a fistula that is failing to mature. So why that happens? So we really need to be sure, I mean, before we take up the challenge of creating a fistula, it is paramount that we, we evaluate our vessels well uh, to be uh, very, very successful. Because I know that uh, if a success rate of above 90%, 95% is a very good success rate to have. But uh, then again, I know that there, there will be uh, places in the world where uh, even a 10, 20, up to 30 percent failure rate is being, I mean, proposed or is being, is being there, actually. So uh, to achieve a very high rate of success, I think these evaluations are going to be very, very important. Diameter, well, a diameter exce in excess of 3 millimeters, 4 millimeters are available, but not very often in this country. So we are happy with the diameter of vein in excess of 2 millimeters. We have to have a soft, I mean, wall that is not sclerotic, not fibrosed. We need to have a lumen that is free of thrombus. We need to have a good flow, of course. And we have to have a uh, vein that is less branched because that is one reason uh, uh, why the fistulas fail to mature quickly enough. And we need to really have a depth that is not, not really uh, very much uh, hidden under the fat column, a very common picture in case of bulky females. 
And the same thing, I mean, for artery, well, the artery, uh, once we see the vein uh, running on the surface, we are very happy. We think that, okay, it is doable. But arteries are also very, very important because uh, once Sorry for that glitch. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll start again. I uh, think uh, I was uh, talking about the points to remember in evaluation of the arteries. I mean, uh, the artery is also very important. Like I said, uh, we uh, tend to put much of our attention towards the vein, so arteries get to be ignored sometimes, and that may put us in trouble. Uh, so we need to assess this. Uh, I mean, the same session, if you are using the Doppler, we can use the vein. At the same time, we can, we can also evaluate the artery, the flow pattern and the velocities. Uh, evidence of proximal disease, so it can be very reliably assessed through a Doppler uh, evaluation. Like that, uh, I mean, this is the vein, I mean, the normal flow and uh, all those things. So a duplex, whenever possible, uh, should be done before taking up a surgical session of creation of fistula. Uh, well, this is uh, the venogram, I mean, in difficult cases only, I mean, this is, of course, not a routine. I mean, uh, whenever we find that the veins are really dubious and uh, may not be really adequate, then uh, this is the option we have. We can uh, simply place the cannula on the dorsum of the hand. I can really have a venogram done. There was a video, it's not really running very well, and I'll not stop for this. And you can also evaluate the central veins. I mean, uh, so one of the reasons why the fistulas do not mature is uh, probably the uh, outflow obstructions, things like that. So it can be. Uh, so as you can see, it's running. As you can see, I mean, the uh, central veins can be very nicely seen uh, through a very nice um, uh, venogram uh, pictures. So what are the complications that we encounter uh, on a day-to-day -day basis? We have the hemorrhoid hematomas. We have the pseudoaneurysm. We have the uh, thrombosis, arteriovenous fistulas, and all those things. And uh, uh, so this is my personal data. Over the last five years, we have... Uh, I have personally encountered a total of 27 pseudoaneurysms with or without rupture. We have 25 cases of hemorrhage and hematoma and 10 uh, cases of thrombosis. And these are, I mean, stories, I mean, quite miserable stories. So if I would have the time, I would really tell you, I mean, these are really, really miserable. People traveling all the way from uh, the distant corner of the country to us 
uh, for this to be taken care of, and this is very, very unfortunate. Uh, this do happen from time to time, and if we, if we are careful and uh, attentive, this can be minimized, if not totally avoided. And uh, another example of groin pseudoaneurysm that still is, um, uh, is having flow into the cavity, and most of it uh, is already thrombosed, but uh, uh, as you can see, uh, we, can, uh, we can still uh, see some kind of flow into the pseudoaneurysm. It's not really out of danger, this patient. Uh, this, the pseudoaneurysm was there. It was uh, actually surgically repaired. Still, there is a huge swelling after the surgery. So what this might be, we took uh, the patient to the Doppler and we uh, had a kind of picture like this. It could be um, hematoma or it could be even uh, uh, lymphoria or lymphocele or things like that. It turned out to be lymphocele that was growing. So we can have this uh, anastomotic pseudoaneurysm, we can have these uh, fistula aneurysms, we can have central venous obstruction that give pictures like this, huge superficial venous swellings of upper chest and upper arm. So how do we treat them? I mean, I have already uh, discussed a few options here. For pseudoaneurysms, we can uh, do thrombin injection. That is very simple. Of course, we do not do this very often because the thrombin is not readily available and it is not free of complications as well. We can do the ultrasound guided compressions, but uh, as long as the skin overlying the pseudoaneurysm is healthy, we can try this option of ultrasound guided. And we can do surgery and uh, we, can, we can do also the central venous, uh, 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 central venous uh, venoplasties to achieve the central venous obstruction uh, outflow uh, uh, creation. And then we have this fistulopasty thing. I mean, I will uh, probably, if I get an opportunity to talk about this, this is very handy to salvage failing fistula. Uh, we can uh, take help from these uh, fistulaplasties and salvage the fistula before uh, going on to another, creating another fistula. It works really, really nicely. So w this much. So uh, to finish, uh, I think uh, we have these results of 70 and 75 patients, and we achieved good results with fistulaplasty and addressing the complications, keeping the fistula, and also terminating the fistula in both ways. So future is this, and to conclude, I would like to say that the uh, uh, the, the access-related complications are, uh, are there, and they have to be minimized. So to achieve that uh, minimum uh, uh, incidence, we uh, have to be very careful, the vascular surgeons and the dialysis nurses and technicians. And we have to remember the options of fistulaplasty uh, to salvage the failing fistula. Thank you very much. like to start our next session. I want to call Professor Abul Mansur to chair this session and also Dr. Abul Wahab Khan to co-chair this session. Please come to the, come to the stage and start this session. Professor Abul Mansur and Dr. Abdul Wahab Khan.
good afternoon positive good afternoon there is english proverb if i were a bird yes right brothers and his colleagues and subsequently now we can fly dr samad is here he is the pioneer in promoting preventive med- uh, nephrology he has a poem of his own kidney rog jivan nasha koti rodhi bachar asha but now what he is going to deliver in front of us same again if i were a bird now the doctor is becoming an engineer he will tell us something about artificial kidney so professor samad uh, thank you very much for your uh, kind introduction mr chair persons distinguished guest and ladies and gentlemen good afternoon now the session is in hypoglycemic phase so yet <laughs> i will try to uh, give some inspiration in some word especially the news is very inspiring to us kritim kidney toiri korlen bangali bigyani bangali bigyani shobhorai toiri korechen kritim kidney khub shigroi bazar ashbe kidney আকারে হাতের মুঠের সমান খরচ বেশ কম দুই হাজার উনিশের মধ্যেই বাজারে আসার সম্ভাবনা আর্টিফিশিয়াল কিডনি নট ইঞ্জিনিয়ার বাট আই হ্যাভ টু গো থ্রু সাচ হার্ট শে Uh, I would describe this artificial kidney and uh, we have to give answer what answer I will give to the patient how and when they can get this artificial kidney before that uh, what is artificial kidney actually uh, it is the synonyms of hemodialysis but not limited to this it is all type of renal replacement therapy except donor kidney transplantation and the first uh, these uh, 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 dialysis was uh, established the name was given by uh, thomas graham he is the father of dialysis uh, in uh, it was uh, a, about uh, 200 about 200 years ago when he established the principle of dialysis that is if uh, the solvent and solute these uh, these uh, solution is separated by a, a semi permeable membrane and uh, then a diffusion through diffusion the solute can move from its higher concentration to lower concentration o- on the other hand the by osmosis solvent can move from lower concentration of solute to higher concentration of solute and uh, to dialysis recent day uh, in hemodialysis the tens membrane pressure has been added uh, first dialysis this is uh, uh, dialysis uh, treatment was given by dr hess from germany in 1928 and he dialysis six six patient ultimately no one survived and later a successful uh, dialysis was started by kolf and uh, he used a rotator uh, drum here you can see the picture around along the around the drum a cellophane cellophane membrane uh, this membrane was collected uh, from a food uh, packing product and uh, with this uh, tube uh, he made a dialysis machine and uh, this um, uh, in the tub there is solution and he rotated this drum and uh, from blood the toxin Uh, went to this solution and ultimately the first patient of severe acute renal failure survived and later in 1953 in korean where many patient was survived with this rotator drum 
and uh, first successful uh, hemodialysis was done in CKD patient in 1960 by Scribner and um, uh, the patient lived uh, almost 11 years. And uh, uh, father of CAPD is Ten uh, Tenkov and he have started it 1968 and um, with this history we have got the artificial kidneys. But uh, now it has been changed and modernized and many things ha has been added and, uh, um, and after full successful establishment of dialysis and now we can see the this dialysis machine uh, almost everywhere. But uh, there are challenges yet, there are challenges to this dialysis facilities which is available in current years. The patient are bound to a center auto machine. They have no uh, 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 facilities to go away, travel or to work uh, uh, and to go av far away. And CPD, it has a lot of many complications like uh, peritonitis, there is body image changes, there is limitation of ultrafiltration, toxin clearance, and uh, patient cannot go long travel. Less there are Many patients, those, though, uh, those who are living far away, they have no access to hemodialysis center. And patients have to come to the dialysis center uh, through traffic jam. They cannot drink adequate water. They cannot uh, take adequate food and fruits, whatever he likes. So there are a lot of limitations to this pre present uh, dialysis facility. Uh, these uh, limitations compromise the quality of life in ESRD patient on dialysis. So how to, how can we overcome uh, these challenges? And uh, that gives idea to the innovators. And there are many innovators there working. And what the innovators are thinking and doing and uh, what at present available and in future uh, renal replacement therapy, I like to go in short through four stages. Stage one, enhanced dialysis. Stage two, portable and home-based dialysis. Stage three, ultra-portable wearable or wearable dialysis. And uh, stage four, implantable biohybrid or regenerated kidney. First of all, en enhanced dialysis, its benefit is increased flexibility for patients on treatment and reduce disease complications. Example are automated uh, peritoneal dialysis and other the changes in dialyzer, that is high flux, dialyzer, middle flux, dialyzer, like that. And uh, these are at present, uh, uh, we can avail it, a patient can avail it. And it to it has been added one uh, that is uh, what uh, in previous speaker is telling about uh, every fistula, but uh, there is a lot of complications and sometimes there is blockage of the fistula and the older elderly patient, diabetic patient, they cannot get any the vascular problem, so cannot undergo any fistula creation. For them, there is a, a human acellular vessel has been developed recently and it is soon coming in the market and patient can buy this graft and it, it will leave uh, in the body more than every fistula and artificial graft. And another innovation is artificial intelligence. This can be added to the patient and uh, he can take the decision according to data entry about uh, uh, how much uh, fluid should be uh, ultrafiltrated and uh, when anyway should be management and many other management like that. These are added, uh, adding to the new artificial kidney. Number two is portable bay or home based. And the benefit is higher patient independence and freedom of movement, work and travel, continuous or near continuous treatment. Example, portable artificial kidney and a key player, some companies are making it and portable devices are already in the market and uh, disadvantages it is heavy a bit heavy but not like that heavy machine 
it is 25 to 40 kg weight and needs electrical connection and large volume of dialysis. So next step, ultra portable or wearable uh, artificial kidney. Its the benefit is much higher patient independence and freedom of movement. He can work, he can travel, reduce treatment impact for patients on work mobility or travel. Continuous treatment can be given, improve social and physical well-being connections and significantly lower dialysis requirement. Example, wearable artificial kidney for hemodialysis or PD with ser servant dialysis regeneration. And uh, these are yet not available, but these are on trial. And uh, we hope it will be available within three to five years. About servant, few words I like to tell. Uh, servant, uh, this is the process by which the dialysis, which is already used up. This used up dialysis can be purified again for reuse. And uh, here, uh, there is micro module to it. The all the toxins are attached when pa the dialysis pass through it, and uh, then uh, it become the dialysis become toxin free, and it is and this and then it could be used for reuse repeatedly, repeatedly and repeatedly. In wearable automated. Uh, Wearable uh, artificial kidney sorbent technology is not only leading to significant reduction in the amount of fresh dialysis required per therapy, but enabling miniaturization of hemodialysis systems. This is automated wearable artificial kidney, and uh, here you can see. The from peritoneum fluid is uh, pumped by cyclar battery. It is battery uh, pumped by battery, uh, no need of electrical connection. And it goes to the storage. And uh, from storage, it goes to the solvent. And it is purified. Then again, it is enriched by enriched model, module. And uh, then this enriched fluid is again recirculated to the peritoneum. In this way, repeated recirculation takes place. Uh, on the other hand, for the hemodialysis, uh, he is the main player is the Ms. Victor Gora, MD, and he is working for last decades. And uh, ultimately, uh, produced a wearable artificial kidney, which can be used in belt in loin. And here also, this module uh, shows dialyzer. There is a uh, uh, a servant module and also uh, the enrichment module. So here it is a uh, busy slide, so I will not go in detail. Just you can uh, see it is recirculated. Fluid is recirculated repeatedly and the uh, patient can wear it and it may continue for dialysis. And with this initially, this machine was about 10 kg, the first one. Later it become five, 5 kg and uh, now it has turned to around 2 pounds only. So a patient can wear under his clothes and go anywhere and he can move, dance and work, anything, travel, anything he can do. And uh, so this has many benefits, what already I told. And number four is implantable uh, biohybrid or regenerated kidney. Uh, its benefit is a duplication of kidney function uh, functionally, uh, continuous treatment, recovered and maintained kidney function, elimination of disease impact on patients uh, like uh, unrestricted diet or return to work, uh, unlimited and unlimited uh, readily available supply of organs when needed for transplantation. Example, uh, implantable bio artificial kidney uh, replaced and uh, another is scaffold. 
and, and uh, scaffolded um, uh, produced by uh, uh, from it may be one kidney from animal or human kidney or the, and then a uh, cell can be cultured and can put into it and ultimately it will be produced a kidney these are on research so currently the this artificial kidney has been produced is two part one part is filtration there is nano uh, nano filter with silicon and other part is after filtration many important substance from the blood uh, goes into the filter and that must be reabsorbed and second part is uh, re for reabsorption of the important parts without hampering the reabsorption of uh, going through that is uh, without reabsorbing the toxins so i am going a bit rapidly because time is very limited for me already shown so uh, these are the uh, devices and ultimately uh, it has two components already i told and uh, second part is bioreactor where uh, this second part is produced uh, by a cell culture and it is usually it is uh, taken from a renal tubule and ultimately artificial renal tubule is produced and it is put in the second part and recently uh, a trial has been given in animal that it can be protected from recipient uh, immunity ultimately once it is transplanted no uh, no immunotherapy sh uh, should be given this is shobhorai who produced the field working with filter filter part and william fisel is working with uh, the reabsorbing part the regular part so it can be transplanted like uh, normal ta kidney transplantation and uh, similar connection and uh, so this is the comparison of different devices so how far is this device and uh, when it will be available what is the answer to our our patient uh, answer is the bio hybrid may take around 10 to 12 years and a regenerated uh, kidney from a scaffold it may take uh, about uh, 10 to 15 years but still there is hope uh, recently just uh, a few days ago uh, one uh, 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 this is the newsletter from kidney project that implant implantable bio artificial kidney as a uh, pre clinical milestone that is trialed in animal so we can tell the passion it is near to you but passion will live in dream and reality with hope and happiness thank you all Uh, I invite Dr. Shofikul Bhatt Choudhury. He will speak on opportunity construction on transplanted recipient, transplant recipient. Uh, he is requested to finish in time. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you to the organizing committee. Uh, within the next 15 minutes, I'll give you some idea about the opportunistic infection uh, in kidney transplant patients. We know the kidney transplant is the treatment of choice for ESRD. And if you look at this uh, slide, uh, the most of the infection actually happens within the first first six months the opportunistic infection and among the opportunistic infection you can see the list here but i have no time to cover all these things what i'll do just i'll cover first uh, these two things and if it's time then i may go to another one so let's go about the bk virus uh, the bk virus 
everybody has got about 90% people get infection in the early childhood as a mild respiratory infection, and most of the time we cannot detect it. And uh, later it actually colonized the re renal uh, in the kidney uh, renal urinary tract as a principal site for latent infection. So that's why you may find sometimes BK virus actually shedding into the urine. And the most important thing is how the quantity of the BK virus in the urine, which when it become pathogenic. If you look at this uh, uh, life history of BK virus, it's actually in that these are tubular cells, renal tubule, it regenerate and the T cell actually uh, protect further, uh, re, uh, sorry, not regenerate, uh, replication. And the, the immunocomponent host, the T cell actually protect the replication from the replication of the virus. When there is any immunocompromised host, the virus replication goes on and then is actually come into the urine, you will find the viruria, and it happens about 35 to 40 percent cases. And what happens after that, there is a breakage of the basement membrane and then the VK virus actually goes into the peritubular capillaries and that get the viremia. And if you look at this, there's a lag period of about four weeks and one third of the viremia can actually transmit it into the viremia. What is the importance of this? If you actually don't, without any intervention, this stage can go into the BK virus nephropathy and it happens at the one into 10% cases. And that about 10% cases, zero to 5% cases, you can lose the allograft kidney. So big, the prognosis of BK virus nephropathy is so important that you find in this case, the BAMP classification in 2013, they actually classified A, B, C. The most important thing here is the tubular interstitial changes in the biopsy. If there is a fibrotic changes more than 25%, if you see the two year graft survival is only 50%. But if you intervene very early stage, only inflammatory changes without any tubular interstitial changes, then two years graft survival about 90%. So the BK virus is very important to do the screening because we don't have any uh, prophylactic treatment. So how can you do the screening? You can do the screening by urine test and or blood test. In the urine test, you can do the decoy cells or Hofen cells or BK virus PCR. If you look at this, the sensitivity of the BK, uh, the decoy cells is less. But if you look at the urine, the Hofen, the Hofen is a, this is a actually viral particles which actually combine with TAMS uh, horsepool protein, but the problem is that you need the electron microscopy to detect the Hofen. Although, and it has been shown in one study that is if you find the Hofen in the urine, is the chance of getting BK virus nephropathy is very, very high. It has a very strong correlation with BK virus nephropathy. But what we do in, in our center, we actually send off the urine for BK PCR and BK plasma. And if you do that negative predictive value and sensitivity is very quite strong in among all these three. So evaluation of positive screen, what will do, I mean, and what should be the cutoff point? Actually, the no universal viruria or viremia cutoff value exists for BK virus nephropathy. So you're do doing the screening, but you don't know what you're going to do and what level you should intervene. This is said that if the viral copies is more than 1,000, then you can sa say it is positive, so you have to act on. There's another study says this, if the viral load is more than 5,000 copies in the urine in consecutive three weekly, then it can lead to nephropathy. But in the, trans in the, in the American Transplant Society, they said if the BK virus load in the urine is more than 10,000 copies, then it's a strong correlation with nephropathy. So how you can do the screening? Well, the screening that, that the KDGO guidelines said that you must do the screening every month for the initial six months, then after three months for the next one year. But the American Society of Transplantation, they said, no, you should continue this for two years. In our center, we actually continue for two years. Some center continue for five years. So what is the treatment of BK virus? Well, the main treatment is reduction or discontinuation of immunosuppression. But bear in mind, you can get the rejection. So it's a catch-22. If you treat the case, you are going to lose the kidney. If you don't treat the case, you're also going to lose the kidney. So you should be very careful when you adjust your immunosuppressive treatment. And there is some adjunct therapy for BK virus. So if you do the screening, if you fight the vir virus in the urine, and then the, you go for viremia, what are you going to do? If the 
if it is less than 10,000 copies, then you can actually reduce your immunosuppression and follow up the patient. But if it is more than 10,000 copies, then you can go for kidney biopsy. But this kidney biopsy is controversial nowadays. If the kidney function is normal and you find a good amount of BK virus in the significant number of copies in the blood, you can still treat the patient but reduce the immunosuppression and monitor the patient. But the recommendation is to go for kidney biopsy and you can reduce the immunosuppression. And the kidney biopsy also help you to exclude other, other causes for acute rise in creatinine. So what we can do now, you can do one stat strategy, either you reduce your CNI by 25 to 50 percent in one or two steps, and then if there is no improvement, then you can reduce the anti-proliferative drug like mycophenolate by 50%. If there is no improvement, then follow the discontinuation of anti-proliferative drug like mycophenolate. And it has been shown that if you stop your MMF, the, the virus clearance is more than 90%. So MMF is not good for, it's, it's, a, it's not, it's, it's a good, good for virus replication. So you must stop it or reduce it. The second strategy is you can go either way, reduce first the mycophenolate and then go for CNI. And if there is no improvement, then completely discontinue the anti-proliferative like mycophenolate. So and then you monitor the patient, creating it every one to two weeks and monitor plasma BK virus every two to four weeks. In the meantime, you also, what is, should be your aim, oral prednisolone taper to 10 milligram or less every day. Make sure the tacrolimus level is less than six nanogram. Cyclopsin level uh, is a trough level less than 150 or serolimus less than six. If you continue a mycophenolate, make sure it is less than one gram. So that is actually the way you can actually control the replication of the virus. Well, there is some adjuvant treatment I'm not going to all these details, there is no good supportive uh, evidence in favor of it except the leflunomide. Uh, sometimes you can consider it if the immunoreduction is not useful or helpful. So I'm just going through a, a case of mine, a 66 year old patient, a, a end stage renal disease due to polycystic kidney disease. She received disease donor kidney transplant. Uh, induction treatment was thymoglobulin. Her immunosuppression was mycophenolate, tacrolimus, and prednisolone. So if you look at this, she transplanted in February 2016. We're doing the virus every month, uh, urine and serum. Then we found about five months later, her urine BK virus become positive and the serum copies were 3,280. We're quite nervous at this stage. I reduced the mycophenolate and continued the follow-up, but the viral count going up. So I stopped the mycophenolate, reduced the tacrolimus and prednisolone, and that look in the cup in the next month, the, the the virus in the urine disappeared and BK virus level goes down and within actually about uh, February, within eight months, it's uh, completely cleared after taking off the mycophenolate. And she was last actually reviewed this, uh, this month and the creatinine is wonderful, creatinine 96. So she's now on two immunosuppressant tacrolimus and prednisolone, prednisolone doing well. This another patient is a 50 year old man underwent disease during a kidney transplant in May 25 and in induction treatment with thymoglobulin, five out of six mismatch, and uh, delayed graft function, immunosuppression, myphotic, tacrolimus, and prednisolone. Unfortunately, this patient did not have any follow-up every month, urine and uh, serum for BK virus uh, PCR. Then in about, a, uh, so she was transplanted in May 2015, and then in 2016, February, the creatinine from baseline to 289, we found the BK virus copies 1,000, million, is it? 195,000. So we did a kidney biopsy, and if you look at the kidney biopsy, it's showing the patchy infiltration of the T lymphocytes, and you find the tubulitis as well as the BK virus inclusion bodies and incest inflammation. So what are you going to do? How can you differentiate this uh, from BK virus nephropathy from acute rejection? It's very difficult. But one important thing is in acute rejection, you find the diffuse involvement. But the BK virus, it actually causes patchy involvement of the kidney. So that is one point. But if you find these changes, uh, like 
arteritis, fibrinoid necrosis, glomerulonephritis, or C4D deposit along the peritubular capillaries, then it will go in favor of ATN. So if the patient has got both ATN and BK virus, how are we going to treat it? It's another difficult condition. So we actually treated this patient with methyl prednisolone first to control the uh, rejection, and we cut down, we stopped the mycophenolate and converted to as a thioprene. And this is actually, see, uh, the patient actually now on azathioprine, tacrolimus, and prednisolone, and the creatinine at the moment is 273. So it's, it's holding up the allograft kidney function. I go very quickly now, another one, if the time permits, is the CMB, this is another commonest cause of, okay, infection. And uh, if you look at this, the most important risk factor for CMB is a serological mismatch between donor and the recipient. So if you find this, the donor is positive, the recipient is negative, that's a high risk group. But if, there, if, the do, if the recipient is positive, then there's a moderate group. If the both is negative, it's a low risk group, less than 5%. So this group does not need any CMB prophylaxis. The CMB prophylaxis is only for high risk and moderate risk. And the recommendation is give the anti-prophylactic treatment for six months if the high risk group, but for the moderate risk group, you give the, anti, uh, the prophylaxis for three months. In the low risk group, you don't need to give any CMB prophylaxis, but what you need to give, you give the prophylaxis other herpes viruses like acyclovir or valcyclovir. And remember that this patient should receive uh, CMB negative blood product or liquid depleted blood. How can you prevent it? You can do two way, universal prophylaxis or preemptive therapy. I'm not going to get details. We actually in our center, we do the universal prophylaxis because the preemptive therapy is actually difficult to implement because you need to do it every week for the next four months. Interestingly, if you whether, whether you do universal prophylaxis or preemptive therapy, there is no significant difference in graft loss or mortality with either approach. What you can give, you can give the Velgan cyclovir 900 milligram daily and adjusted for renal function, but in some center, they give the Vel acyclovir, but you need to give a big dose. But in our center and most of the center, they give the Velgan cyclovir 900 milligram daily. There's one study showed that 450 milligram, but we don't practice this one. So how can you diagnose CMB? You can diagnose CMB by either antigenemia or you do the NAT test, nucleic acid testing, CMB, PCR. In our center, we do this test because if you want to do the antigenemia, it, you need to send the specimen within six to eight hours. Because if you send the specimen from the periphery, then the result will be, uh, will be incorrect. But you can do the, uh, if, if you can do on a site, then this is also a good test to detect infection. Bear in mind, there is also in the tissue invasion, you need to do confirmation by immunohistochemistry. But most important thing, serology has no role in the diagnosis of active CMB disease after transplantation. So don't send off for CMB IgM, it's absolutely useless. Treatment of CMB, you can give the oral vengancyclovir for less severe disease. You can give orally if the disease is less severe, but you can give the IV. And you must monitor the response because it is important to see whether the CMB is resistant, is a drug resistant. In case of drug resistant, this is the treatment. For the time constraint, I just move very quickly. This is a 55 year old man pres presented in December 2014, weight loss, lethargy, short of breath and vomiting. He had a living donor kidney transplant, 2008 creatinine staying at 186. Immunosuppression, tacrolimus, microphenolate, prednisolone, and he was not on any Bactrim, prophylaxis. He, this is his check X-ray. You can see the left pleural effusion, and there's a small round lesion here. We do the CT brain. He's got a lot of quite cavity, quite a one is a, like a cavity lesion in the brain. One is there, and we do the MRI. Definitely, he has got a lesion. So what he has got? What is the diagnosis? Now, we actually, he underwent craniotomy, and we actually cultured the tissue. We found it's a nocardia. 
So nocardia infection has increased in the last four decades. And frequency in solid organ transplant is not that great, but it's going up. And the common within the first year of post-transplant, but you can get the knockout in the late transplant. The treatment is antibiotic. So most important thing is secondary prophylaxis with um, um, Bactrim double strength. But interesting thing is that even you can get the infection if you give the Bactrim, because in this is called breakthrough infection in uh, Bactrim susceptible nocardia in patient taking Bactrim. Regardless, nowadays we give the Bactrim for indefinite period, we don't stop it. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Uh, now inviting <laughs> Dr. Ehsanuddin uh, Khan, he will speak on hemodialysis catheter and its management. Thank you, Ms. <coughs> Mr. Chairperson. I think everybody will not <coughs> will be happy if I would not be here for uh, more than 10 to 15 minutes. So I'm starting. Uh, my topic is issues related to hemodialysis catheter and management. Chronic kidney disease is a currently uh, <coughs> is currently a public health problem. More than 50 million people worldwide live, lose their lives annually due to risk of kidney failure. When kidney fails to maintain its function, we label this ESRD, and hemodialysis is the most common renal replacement today. A vascular access is done, and central venous catheter are an important means of delivering hemodialysis to patients who require medi immediate initiation of dialysis. This next two slide uh, shows the geographical variation where uh, hemodialysis or AV fistula for the initiation of hemodialysis. In our country, we mostly use hemod uh, ca uh, hemodialysis catheter for the initiation of dialysis. And these are the data from 2003 to 2016, where the use of AV fistula increases, but the rate of hemodialysis catheter for the initiation of dialysis is still steady. Types of hemodialysis access, we all usually use fistula graft and central venous catheter. There are some pros and cons of central venous catheter dialysis. Uh, the availability of multiple sites for the pros of central venous catheter is for insertion of most patients. Can be used immediately after insertion and ability to use for months. No requirement for needle access. It's easy of use and painless access, low cost, and absence of cardiopulmonary circulation that is easy to remove and replace also. Cause the in case of catheter, there are high infection rate, direct line to heart contributes to more free of life setting infection, clots more frequently and difficult to obtain sufficient blood flow, uh, not a permanent access option also. There are two types of catheters, tunnel cuff catheters and untunnel cuff catheters. We use uncut catheter for short time and tunnel cuff catheter for the long term. This is some this is picture of tunnel catheters. Indication of venous catheters, we all know. Uh, acute injury access is in following access, acute kidney injury, injury, hemodialysis or hemoperfusion, ESRD patients who need ardent hemodialysis but without available mature access. Lost effective use of permanent access and required temporary access for hemodialysis, patients requiring plasma paresis, patients who abdomen are being rested prior to new PD catheter placement and uh, transplant recip uh, recipient needing temporary hemodialysis during severe rejection episodes. Uncuffed versus cuff catheters. The risk of infection of uncuffed catheters increases markedly after the first week. Use cuff catheter. We should use cuff catheter if the anti anticipated need for dialysis is longer than one week. If prolonged need for dialysis is like to at the outset, a cuff catheter can be inserted initially in the right internal jugular vein. Immediate complication, there are some immediate complication and there is some uh, uh, remote complication. Immediate complication, arterial puncture, bleeding, catheter malposition, king, catheter of hemodialysis and cardiac arrhythmias. There are also hemothorax, hemothorax and hemomedistum. There, are, there may be injury to the arrhythmia structure like brachial plexus, recurrent laryngeal nerve. Long term complication, we all know the issues is catheter dysfunction, thrombosis, stenosis and catheter related infection. Catheter dysfunction is actually poor flow. The catheter dysfunctions by the NCAP category as the failure to maintain blood flow of equal or more than 300 ml per minute 
with a p-pump arterial pressure of less than minus 250 millimeter mercury. This function may result from catheter kinking, catheter malposition, leakage, thrombotic complication such as intercardiac thrombosis and fibrin sheet formation. Fibrin sheet reported up uh, almost all catheters develop a fibrin sleeve within week one or two after the insertion originates at the insertion site and migrates down length of the catheter it may occlude the catheter site holes or create a vacuum effect resulting in the ability to draw blood or from the catheter provide media for bacterial colonization and enhance catheter related bacteremia this is a picture of catheter kinking and uh, in the right hand side there is after reversal this is kinking clots and fibrin sheet thrombosis we mentioned earlier the next is thrombosis thrombosis there may be interluminal thrombosis and embol uh, then intercardiac thrombosis and embolic complication interluminal thrombosis treated by installation of tissue plasminogen activator for one hour or longer and central vein intercardiac thrombosis in with large indwelling catheters usually intra-arterial thrombinic prolonged systemic anti erosion for six months or longer large clots adherent to the end of the catheter or to the vessel wall can be clinically silent or can give rise to embolic events uh, treatment options include simple catheter removal, systemic or catheterized signal arthroscopy, and rarely thoracotomy with thrombectomy. Central venous stenosis within the vessels, turbulence of blood flow, endothelial injury, uremic relief, and inflammatory response plays an inform, uh, important roles in development of stenosis, may be associated with development of collar vessels and compensatory dilation of the azagos vein. Subclean vein catheters are especially associated with stenosis. Treatment involves endoplasty and alone or endoplasty with stent placement. Catheter adherence. Uh, catheterization is a problem and laser is not open surgical removal is often required catheter related infection this is very important uh, catheter infection is the leading cause of catheter loss and increases morbidity and mortality infection results from contamination of catheter connectors lumen contamination migration from the patient's own skin flora or from colonization from bacteria catheter related infection may be exercise infection tunnel infection and catheter related blood donor infection Exercise infection when it is within 2 cm of the catheter exit site in the absence of concomitant BSI or without concomitant prevalence. Investigate for nasal carriers of Staphylococcus and if present, treated with internasal mupericinitin. Treatment with lo local topical antibiotic cream and oral antibiotic. Indication for catheter removal when systemic sinus infection passed from the tract, the infection persists or recurs after an initial course of antibiotic and positive blood test. This is a picture of exit site infection and tunnel infection when the induration or erythema is greater than 2 cm from the catheter site along the subcutaneous tract of a tunnel catheter in the absence of concomitant BSI. If there is purine drainage, it should be collected from and sent for gum, uh, gum staining and culture. This can result in systemic bacteria and in case of drainage of signs of systemic infection, the catheter should be removed immediately and antibiotic therapy constructed. This is tunnel infection. This is uh, uh, some clinical definition of CRBSI. Catheter related blood inf infection was based on the clinical presentation of fever, chills, hypotension, and any of the following criteria. The uh, organism recovered from the percutaneous blood culture and from the culture of the catheter tip. Same organism recovered from a catheter cul uh, from the percutaneous and a catheter lumen blood cultures where the growth detected two hours earlier in the blood collected through the catheter. Risk for CRBSI, elderly patient, diabetes mellitus, obesity. Catheters, nasal carriers of Staphylococcus aureus, hypoalbuminemia, past history of BSI, immunocompromised host, and late referrals. Complications of CRBSI primary, there may be sepsis syndrome, DIC, or even death, metastatic complications like endocarditis, osteomyelitis, septic arthritis, septic pulmonary emboli, and spinal epidural abscesses. The gram positive organism, there should be gram negative bacilli, and there should be, uh, there, there, there could be polymicrobial. In case of gram positive cocci, the Staphylococcus is the most uh, is the most common organism and we can we should start empirical uh, antimicrobial therapy when suspected crbsi antimicrobial therapy should be started as soon as possible with a bacterial agent against uh, staphylococcus aureus and coagulase negative gram positive especially if associated with septic or septic shock vancomycin is recommended for empirical therapy if vancomycin is not available then we can use gaptomycin linozole should only be used when having sensitivity for the previously mentioned agent Conservative management of CRBSI should be attempted when hemo with hemodialysis patient. Combining systemic and local intercatheter antibiotic is associated with better results when compared to systemic antibiotics alone. In patient with a tunnel hemodialysis catheter, guidewire exchange is an ontology, especially when catheter removal is not feasible. Uh, this is a picture which is uh, obtained from the 
uh, Infectious Disease Society of North America and ERBP European Renal uh, Best Practice Guideline 2007. When we suspect uh, catheter-related blood uh, tunnel uh, with suspected CRBSI, then empirical antibiotics should be given with antibiotic blocks. If negative blood pressure comes, we should stop uh, antibiotics. If resolution of bacteremia and fungi within three two to three days, then we have to decide some things. If there is uh, coagulase negative staphylococci, we should continue antibiotic for uh, 10 to 14 days. We should retain CBC uh, or guide direct change. If gum positive, basically the treatment is the same. If staphylococcus aureus, we should remove CBC and antibiotic for three weeks. And uh, if uh, transesophageal endoscopy is negative, uh, if candida, we should uh, guide direct change. We, we could uh, guide direct change of CBC, administered antifungal therapy for 14 days. If there is persistent bacteria and fungi for 40, uh, 48 to 72 hours, then remove CBC, administer antibiotic. And we should, uh, uh, there also uh, antibiotic block therapy. If we want to salvage the catheter, we, we have to use antibiotic block therapy along with the systemic antibiotic. Antibiotic block therapy, in case of antibiotic block therapy, we can use vancomycin and gentamicin. We usually use gentamicin in our, in our center. And uh, vascular catheter removal, the uh, removal of the indication for immediate removal is severe sepsis, hemorrhagic instability, metastatic infecti infection, signs of congestion. I'm running short of time. There should be some catheter care. and. Uh, in I'm actually running short of time. Uh, what should we uh, what should we expect? We can expect uh, catheter which is uh, which can wh which is uh, which can cause less thrombosis, less infection, and less stenosis in the future. Nevertheless, the rigorous implementation of standard infection control measures for hygiene and effective handling of the vascular access at all times would remain a key to minimize the BSA episode and significantly improve the long-term age outcome. Thank you very much. বিনতপথে ক্ষমা প্রার্থনা করছি আমাদের একটু সময় আরেকটু সময় লাগবে আপনারা যথেষ্ট ক্ষুধা আছে একটু একটু সময় দিলে আমরা এক মিনিট করে লাস্ট মিনিট করে ক্ষমা প্রার্থনা করব আপনি কোন দিকে আছেন একটু সময় দিলে আই কল ফর দা লাস্ট সেশন অফ গ্রুপ ইন দা সোকন 2019 আই উড লাইক টু কল আপ দা স্টেজ প্রফেসর এমডিনিস প্রফেসর মোহাম্মদ নিজামুদ্দিন চৌধুরী চেয়ারম্যান অফ দা সেশন and Dr. Muhammad Nazir Islam, co-chairman of this session, call on the stage. Sorry. Sorry. Chairman sir is not in here. So I would like to request Professor, Professor, Dr. Mamun Mustafi sir, to present as a chairman for this session. Okay, thank you. Thanks for inviting me. I know this is how you feel because 
lot of things have been dumped on you and you have been given nothing to eat. So, hey, see hello. Okay, so let me start with one of our patients, uh, Mr. Shuruz Mia, 51 year old carpenter from Kishagans, developed intermittent fever and multiple joint pain for five months. He also complained of repeated attacks of nasal discharge and epistaxis, which subsided spontaneously. He is diagnosed with a case of sinusitis and treated with several courses of antibiotics. After several weeks, he started passing red urine on and off, no burning sensation, normal frequency. He also developed bilateral leg swelling. On examination, he, ha he was conscious, oriented, he had periorbital puffiness, a bilateral pitting ankle edema, and moderately anemic. Blood pressure was 150 over 95 millimeter of mercury. His urine examination showed alumin 2 plus, RBC plenty, and RBC cast 2 plus. Urine total protein was 2.09 gram per day. And his serum creatine on day one was 2.9. On day two, it increased to 5.6. And day three, it was 7.9. And he had bilateral swollen kidneys. So we diagnosed him with a case of rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis, and we put him on injection methylprednisolone from the day two, and we also dialyzed him, and we did a kidney biopsy. And the biopsy came out to be crescentic glomerulonephritis with no immune deposits. We then got the serology reports, and C3, C4, ANA, and entities DNA all were negative. MPO ANCA was normal, but PR3 ANCA was remarkably raised more than 300 units per ml. So we diagnosed him as a case of anca shredded vasculitis with crescentic glomerulonephritis, a case of granulomatosis with polyangitis. So in this study by University of North Carolina Nephrology uh, Lab, anca shredded posimian crescentic glomerulonephritis was found to be the most common, uh, most common cause of uh, rapidly progressive kidney failure in all age groups. Vasculitis are customarily divided into uh, different types according to the size of the vessel it affects. Small vessel vasculitis are basically of two types, immune complex mediated and anca assuated. So what are anca assuated uh, vasculitis? These are the group of disorder which causes necrotizing vasculitis with few or no immune deposits. So these are called posimmune. It predominantly affects small vessels, capillaries, venules, arterioles, and small arteries. And there is presence of anti-neutrophil cytoplasmic antibody, um, specific for myeloperoxidase or proteinase 3. In 2012, uh, Chapel Hill Consensus Conference was held in North Carolina, USA, to define different types of anca vasculitis. And clinical pathologically, anca vasculitis is divided into microscopic polyangitis, granulomatosis with polyangitis, eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangitis, and renal limited vasculitis. MPONCA causes perinuclear staining. MPONCA causes perinuclear staining. So that's why it was initially called PIANCA. And MR3 ANCA causes diffuse granular cytoplasm staining. This is PR3 ANCA. That is initially it was called CIANCA. MPONCA is shared with. MPA and EGPA, and PA3 ANCA is associated with GPA. Though initially it was thought that ANCAs are just surrogate markers, they do not really take uh, a part in the disease activity, but now there, are, there is clinical in vitro and animalist model evidence that ANCAs cause disease by activating neutrophils to attack the blood vessels, resulting in necrotizing or granulomatous inflammation. So though three types of ANCA have a lot of similarities uh, among, their clinical, uh, among the clinical presentation, but there, is, there are some distinctive features of each ANCA vasculitis. Eosinophilia and resistant asthma are characteristic features of uh, GPA, uh, characteristic features of uh, EGPA, and all three types of ANCA can present with renal problem renal disease, especially MPA and GPA. Typical presentation is rapidly progressive kidney failure due to post-immune crescentic glomerulonephritis. But it also can present with other presentations like 
proteinuria or hematuria. Lung involvement is quite common in uh, Anka vasculitis, and many patients present with pulmonary renal syndrome. Cavitary and non cavitary lung nodules and hemoptysis due to diffuse alveolar hemorrhage for, uh, from pulmonary capillaritis uh, can be a common presentation in seen all, all three types of Ankas. Both GP and AJPA can present with upper airway disease like uh, rhinitis, epistaxis, sinusitis, but uh, GPA causes also causes destructive sinus and nasal disease, resulting in saddle nose deformity or destruction of sinus. Skin rashes are similar to other small vessel vasculitis, and eye involvement is a feature of GPA, it's causing it's evoitis, conjunctivitis, scleritis, and neurological involvement can happen in all three types, usually in the form of mononeuritis multiplex. So how do you manage uncashed vasculitis? Timely diagnosis and rapid institution of appropriate immunomodulatory therapy is critically important for optimal renal outcome in patients with Anka-GN. And we need to remember, in a patient presented with RPGN due to Anka vasculitis, time is nephrons. You lose time, you lose nephrons. The treatment is divided into two basic parts, remission induction and remission maintenance. Remission induction for first three to three to six months and remission maintenance for 18 to 24 months. So what do the guidelines suggest uh, about remission induction? All guidelines recommend pulse methyl prednisolone, 250 to 1,000 milligram daily for three days, followed by oral prednisolone, one milligram per kg per day. This is suggested by all guidelines as the first line of management, but uh, no cons consensus on tapering regimen or duration of glucocorticoid therapy. Cyclophosphamide, in addition to steroids, has been uh, uh, advocated by all guidelines as first line in severe oncovasculitis. Rituximab, instead of cyclophosphamide, can be used and is recommended as first line when cyclophosphamide is contraindicated or non-preferred. Plasma exchange may be considered during induction if patient has got a creatinine more than 500 micromole RPGN or pulmonary hemorrhage or patient is refractory to treatment. So should we use daily oral or intravenous pulse cyclophosphamide? This question was answered in this cyclops study where one uh, 49 patients with ankyvasculitis were randomized to receive either daily oral cyclophosphamide or intravenous pulse cyclophosphamide. And they found that there was no difference in remission between these two groups. But on, on long-term followers, there was harder relapse risk in IV cyclophosphamide group, but long-term renal and patient outcome were similar. So which drug should we use with steroids, cyclophosphamide or rituximab? So there has been a lot of trials, and head-to-head -head comparison between cyclophosphamide and rituximab was done in these trials, two trials, RAVE and rituxvas. In, uh, in RAVE trial, uh, rituximab was uh, tested against daily oral cyclophosphamide, and rituxvas trial, rituximab was compared with intravenous pulse cyclophosphamide. And both this trial found that the number of patients achieving remission in both with cyclophosphamide and rituximab had were, no, were not different. So the conclusion was rituximab therapy is as good as cyclophosphamide treatment for induction remission in severe oncovasculitis and may be superior in relapsing disease. Rituximab, rituximab also found to be safe, no significant difference total or severe adverse events between cyclophosphamide group and rituximab group. And both these trials also established long-term efficacy of rituximab in keeping patients relapse free. So do these studies unequivocally support rituximab over cyclophosphamide in oncovasculitis? The answer is no, not yet. Potential there are some potential advantages of cyclophosphamide over rituximab, like faster onset of action, easier to initiate therapy, and in a country like ours, cyclophosphamide is much cheaper than rituximab. So do this study, so how about combining rituximab and cyclophosphamide together for du uh, during induction? So this study done by McAdoo et al., they uh, conducted a single center cohort study of 66 patients uh, and, and treated them with a combination of oral steroids, rituximab, and low-dose pulse intravenous cyclophosphamide 
followed by a maintenance regimen of azathioprine and tapered steroid. And they found that at, at six months, 94% patient achieved remission, but the cumulative dose of both rituximab and was much lower. So it appears to be safer and more effective combining rituximab and cyclophosphamide for induction. Long-term follow-up showed very high overall and ESRD-free survival and very low relapse rate. And these, then these patients were compared with one, uh, 198 propensity-matched control patients enrolled in the European Vascular Study Group. And they found that comparing it this with the European Vascular Study Group patients, we were treated with standard regimen. These patients treated with combination of eduximab and cyclophosphamide had a reduced risk of death, progression to ESRD, and reduced relapse risk. So the uh, rec uh, summary about cyclophosphamide plus rituximab is rituximab plus short course intravenous or power cyclophosphamide can be used safely, lower mortality and lower risk of relapse compared to historical controls. So how about microfilar and morphetil for remission induction? Because initially, some patients were uh, treated with microfilar and morphetil for induction of remission, but it was found that there were higher, much higher relapse rate in patients treated with microfilar compared to intravenous cyclophosphamide. So does plasmapheresis have a role in oncovasculitis? 137 patients with oncovasculitis were randomized in this MAPEX trial to receive either intravenous methylprednisolone or plasmapheresis as a first-line treatment, and bo all, both this, all these patients were treated with a standard regimen of oral glucocorticoids and uh, oral cyclophosphamide, and the patient was followed up. They did not find any significant difference between dialysis-free at 12 months. ESRD long-term was not also different, significantly different. 12 months survival was similar, and su long-term survival was similar in both these groups. In the PEXPAX trial, uh, PEXIVAS trial, 704 patients with severe oncovasculitis were randomized to receive either plasmapheresis or no plasmapheresis, and in addition to usual induction treatment. And they were followed up for eight years, and they did not found any significant difference in composite outcome of, of death or endocrinal disease between these two groups. So how about maintenance immunosuppression? Who needs maintenance immunosuppression? What is, what is the drug of choice for maintenance immunosuppression and how long do we use maintenance immunosuppression? So what do the guidelines suggest? AZA or methotrexate, alatheoprine or methotrexate are universally recommended by all guidelines for remission maintenance. And they advise to use microphenolate if patient is intolerant to alatheoprine. And they are advised to avoid methotrexate if GFR is less than 30 ml per minute. The Canadian vasculitis guideline recommend use of rituximab for remission maintenance after patients are induced with rituximab, especially, I mean, especially with PR3 ANCA positive patients. Patients with PR3 ANCA or GPA are more likely to relapse than patients with MPU ANCA. And duration of maintenance is 18 to 24 months usually, but some guidelines have suggested longer duration for PR3 ANCA positive patients. Who needs maintenance immunosuppression? All oncovasculitis patients require maintenance immunosuppression regardless of ANCA type. So microphenolate morphetil was also used for remission maintenance in oncovasculitis patients, but it was found to be actually with more relapse compared to alatheoprine. The main Wittsan trial compared rituximab 500 milligram intravenous every six months to alatheoprine for remission maintenance. And five-year follow-up showed that patients treated with azathioprine, 37% of them were relapse-free, but compared to th these patients, patients treated with rituximab, 58% of the patient were relapse-free. So rituximab appears to be a better remission maintenance agent compared to azathioprine. So how long do, do we use maintenance immunosuppression with azathioprine? And this question was answered by Remain study where 170 patients were who were on stable remission after 18 to 48 months of diagnosis were randomized to either continue the uh, maintenance immunosuppressions or withdraw the maintenance immunosuppressions. And they were followed up for 48 months. And what they found is 
Prolonged remission maintenance therapy with azathioprine and penicillin beyond 24 months after diagnosis reduces relapse risk out of out to 4 to 8 months and improves renal survival in oncovasculitis. So, Mr. Chairpersons, I like to conclude that rapidly rapidity of response after timely diagnosis is the key to save the kidneys in oncovasculitis, and we must remember in a patient with RPGN time is nephrons. You lose time, you lose nephrons. Thank you. Gentlemen, we have got a very uh, vibrant guest speaker from Indonesia. He is the head of nephrology division and hypertension of Sir Saiful Anwar Jain Hospital, Malang, Malaysia. He is a genius there. He was awarded doctoral and many awards in his field. It is my pleasure to invite Professor Atma Gunawan. Professor Atma Gunawan to provide his uh, speech to the nephrologist and assistants of Bangladesh Nephrology, nephrology Committee. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you for chairman to invite us uh, to present in this session. I'd like to uh, share about uh, dialysis implementation in uh, Indonesia. Indonesia is archipelago uh, country with uh, around 14,000 islands and we are in the fourth rank in the world population around 270 million. And nine, in 1990 we still faced with the uh, infection and malnutrition but after 20 years we are dealing with the problem uh, diabetes, cancer, and cardiovascular uh, disease. Unfortunately, we now has the national health insurance, and this insurance is the biggest participant in the world. Uh, consists of 223 million, and now coverage for around. 30 uh, 80% of our population and this insurance uh, coverage 100% uh, health cost uh, also for dialysis and for kidney uh, transplant and currently around 80% of our hemodialysis patients are covered by uh, national health insurance. Claim fee are paid on a prospective uh, payment uh, basis. And you so you see in the table, uh, around 60% of the participant is paid by government because they are uh, poor uh, people. You look here the expenditure of uh, by national health insurance for health services. You look around 22% of the total health cost is for catastrophic disease. And the uh, kidney failure is uh, consists of twelve percent of the expenditure for catastrophic uh, disease. We also has Indonesian renal registry, and it has uh, built since uh, two thousand eight. It registry for all dialysis patient on dialysis program. All dialysis centers should be upload data to ARL every six months and now it register for around 82 percent of all dialysis center in Indonesia and we now register also for 88 hemodialysis machine available in Indonesia and this registry is funded by the Indonesian Society of Nephrology. 
you look here in the table that uh, around 80 percent of uh, hemodialysis center register to ARR. The preference of CKD in Indonesia based on the data from Ministry of Health, the kidney disease is around OH38 uh, percent, but then uh, we perform uh, epidemiological survey uh, in the four area done in 2009. The prevalence of CKD we found is about 12.5%. Uh, but based on the current data from ERR in 2008, our prevalence for ASRD is around uh, almost uh, 600 uh, patient per million population. And now we have around 660,000 patients on ASRD. This is the hemodialysis uh, center. Hemodialysis center should be established uh, uh, on must obtain permission from the Office of Health and also requirement to Indonesian Society of Nephrology. And doctors who are responsible for hemodialysis patients are nephrologists or internists on general practitioners uh, who receive training for hemodialysis. Training usually lasts about six months. And hemodialysis centers led by internists or general practitioners must be supervised by nephrologists. So nephrologists may be uh, supervised for five or six uh, hemodialysis centers. And this one is hemodialysis fair for hospital you look here for type C and D. Type C is and D is the hospital for primary care. Is the cost for hemodialysis around 50 to 60 million uh, dollar US dollar. But for type A and B, this one is referral hospital. The fare for hemodialysis is about 60 to 74 uh, US dollar. Here our dialysis patient, you look, is almost 98% of hemodialysis. For CAPD, only very less, 2%. And our prevalence is 160,000 patients, so still uh, 25,000 patients uh, still live without uh, renal replacement therapy. And you look here, from 2007 to 2018, the increasing patient on hemodialysis. Here the mapping of our CIPD patient. If we look here, actually the CIPD patient has been the well distributed to many islands in Indonesia. But if we look, only 10% of hemodialysis centers uh, serve uh, for CIPD patient. And you look here in my hospital, Malang, uh, the biggest uh, patient is uh, in, in the hospital is uh, three 390 patients and, and we look here for logistic, human logistic in my hospital, 770 patients on hemodialysis managed by 50 nurse, but for 390 patients on CRPD only managed by uh, five nurse. So CRPD is uh, very less in human logistic. This one is the located of hemodialysis centers, mostly uh, more than 80% located in, 100% uh, is located in hospital. Clinic is very, very less, 0.5%, and mostly in the hospital, primary hospital, type C and type D. <coughs> but nephrologists only working in the referral hospital. So mostly of the uh, uh, hemodialysis centers managed by non-nephrologists. This one, the etiology of our SRD patients. And you look here, nephropathy, diabetes, hypertension, and glomerulonephritis, chronic glomerulonephritis, and nephropathy obstruction is the leading uh, cause of the patient for ASRD. This one is our hemodialysis uh, profile patients. Uh, most our uh, patients uh, perform twice 
uh, week for hemodialysis and some is uh, a week, uh, one a week, and duration four to five hours. Most initial vascular vascular access uh, is central venous catheter and insertion to artery and vein, commonly femoral vein. Majority use high plug dialyzer and we uh, uh, mostly using uh, reusable dialyzer and less than 20% uh, use machine of re uh, machine for reuse. So mostly as still reused by uh, manual or by hand. This one example, uh, how uh, uh, in, in my hospital, how the hemodialysis patient is uh, very crowded. You look here, around 60% hemodialysis still once a week and 40% uh, two times uh, a week. Now we facing the problem about the capacity yeah, and also transportation cost for patient. Even the hemo uh, fee for hemodialysis is free. So because how many patients uh, perform hemodialysis uh, two times or less, so many complications uh, related with hemodialysis patient. This one example in the uh, biggest government hospital in Jakarta uh, for complication hemodialysis, mostly is anemia and heart uh, cardiac enlargement, hypertension, fluid overload, and metabolic acidosis. Hepatitis B and C, you very less patient on HBS uh, antigen positive and about 19% uh, is anti-ACT positive. Our challenge is uh, Indonesian population gets free charge for dialysis, but there are still 25,000 patients who have been not served by dialysis. And the main problem is how to build an additional hemodialysis machine and also about transportation subsidized for patient. Most of hemodialysis service are performed by non-nephrologists and actually funding from national health insurance is not enough to cover all expenses related to patient complication. And hemodialysis has not met the adequacy standard. The quality of life patient HD, HD is still low and very less patient on CRPD. This is our program now. We now perform early detection for CKD and prevention for CKD. And all diabetes patients now uh, uh, perform uh, urinalysis and HR and creatinine serum every six months for all diabetic patients. And now our plan is to increase CRPD coverage from 2% to 10%. Uh, so we will coverage about still patient 25,000 without any treatment for ASRD. I think this one, my end slide. Thank you. Assalamualaikum. <coughs> I know that you have got a lot of questions, but as we, we have already overstood the time, so I am not uh, going to divide any more time. Next speaker is uh, our dear friend, uh, Dr. KBM Habibjaman. KBM Habibjaman graduated from Mans Medical College in 1993 and was awarded MD Doctor of Pharmacy from the Jakarta University. He is currently serving in uh, Bangladesh Sheikh Mujib Medical University as an LCA Professor of Nephrology. Also, he is a Secretary General of Bangladesh Women Association. Dr. KBM Habibjaman, please. Talk on, talk on management of uh, tuberculosis in ESR patients. Thank you very much. Uh, it's, uh, we are running out of time. It's the time of already been over.
for lunch, so sorry for the inconvenience. Uh, even though I have to tell something to you regarding the management of tuberculosis, first of all that I have to give thanks to my teacher, Professor Mamun Mustafi, as he has arranged such a wonderful and tremendous this uh, international seminar and symposium. All of we must give a very good big hand to Professor Mamun Mustafi. We are proud of you. Definitely we have to appreciate, as well as I have to give some condolence to my younger nephrologist, Dr. Iftekar Parvez, who died a few days back. So we must remember, we have to, uh, Dr. Parvez Iftekar, a uh, few months back he died, even though now it is running out of time. So I have to tell something regarding the management of tuberculosis in industry renal disease. I don't want to waste time. It's introduction. You know, all you know the management of tuberculosis among USOD patients may be challenging as because of TB is very global burden, not only in Bangladesh. It is also a global burden regarding the management of the uh, this uh, extended tuberculosis and as well as the MDRD TB burden is day by day increasing. So it's very difficult to manage the patients, those who are suffering from this kind of tuberculosis, particularly in chronic kidney disease among USOD patients. Global epidemiology, all of you know the burden of the TB patients are day by day increasing. Now it is, in 2013, it was about uh, 9 million people all over the world. In uh, 1990, this TB mortality and morbidity prevalence have decreased 45% and 41% respectively. But much work is still needs to be done to eliminate this largely preventable and curable infectious disease all over the country and all over the world. Tuberculosis incidence rates are 6 to 25 fold higher among ESRD patients and then the general population of TB. Pathophysiology, all of you know the pathophysiology of the TB management. I don't want to tell, figure. TB risk kidney transplant patients because these patients are getting this immunosuppressive patients. So the TB risk ranging from three to 24 times that of the general population. The reason behind this is uh, mostly in transplant patients, immunosuppression as well as those who are the suffering from the CKD stage, uh, endosteal renal disease, they are also suffering from some sorts of immunosuppression, so they are the most vulnerable group of people, those who are, might, uh, those who are likely to develop tuberculosis. The presentation of uh, this TB often insidious and atypical presentation, patients frequently present with systemic symptoms and fever, anorexia, uh, weight loss symptoms, mimic, uremia, can result in delay. Patients present with pulmonary infection, mostly in the lower, infield, lower field, lower lung field, and the scrotum as well as the STS, the skin test negative. So it is very difficult to diagnose patients, those who are presenting with this kind of features, they are also mimicking the patients of the uremia. So it is difficult to diagnose. TB should be considered in all patients, those who are culture negative peritonitis or culture positive peritonitis. This, uh, that is refractory to appropriate antibiotic treatment even in the absence of their clinical symptoms or signs, suggestive of TB. Laboratory diagnosis of renal tuberculosis, urinalysis is the most important diagnostic tool, as well as we can do documentation of culture negative, pyuria, acidic urea in the urine, early morning steam urine, uh, early morning mid steam urine collected on three consecutive days for microscope and culture. Rapid methods of TB diagnosis are increasingly available. We can do go for the ADA test as well as the serological test, we can go for the PCR, polymerase chain reaction, we also can do the other ileus spot test as well as IGRA, that is called quantiferon TB gold test. These are the very easily detectable and now it is available in our hospital, the quantiferon TB gold test in our country, it's available. Only instead of four or 5,000 taka, you can do the quantiferon TB gold test. Another this LM, that is a, the mm, gene expert as well as the uh, other tests, we can go for the PCR, the, this test detects DNA sequence specific MCB and reformation resistance by PCR. The result can be generated by two hours, as well as the another result is available within 30 minutes. The imaging study also, several imaging study, we can go for contrast enhanced nephrographic, face contrast spectroscopy, CT scan can be done. We see the calcification in the kidney as well as the calcification in the tubular level as well as the other changes in the tubules as well as this. Changes are seen in the uh, renal pelvis, that is a high up pelvis. Another findings, we can see the tubules, those who are, that is called beaded appearance of the ureters, that is uh, leaded to the beaded or corkscrew appearance of the ureters, as well as the, uh, we can see the 
bladder is also fibrous irregular resulting in the view that is basic irregular structure is there high resolution ultrasound is slowly to rule out the obstruction and the study of the parent time closely identify the granuloma small abscess bladder mucosal thickening as well as calcification cities can most study is sensitive <coughs> Cystoscopy, if we are going for the cystoscopy, golf full ureteral orifice or the efflux of both paste like KGS material may come out through the ureter as well as we can do the biopsy, but biopsy in active stage is contraindicated. So, some recommendations regarding the TB diagnosis also we can do TB diagnosis investigation. All patients frequently considered for risk TB should any history of prior TB or TB contact, any history of TB treatment, the drugs taken, treatment, duration, clinical examination, chest x ray, egra should be done already mentioned this test recommendation for management of TB other TB should be considered in all patients unexplained systemic symptoms we already told extrapulmonary TB is common in case of the secretary patients ESRD patients any patients active TB uh, either pulmonary or extrapulmonary should receive a standard chemotherapy regimen habit with the dose interval modification or per as per NICE guideline tick and trap level should be monitored Recommend standard six months or nine months regimen are generally used, but ethambutol is withheld for as a drug susceptible to or bacteriologically negative disease and be whether where susceptibilities are not yet available, but the drug resistance is not suspected. Prolongation of TB treatment is individualized decision. Drug resistance disease is treated with appropriate drugs as indicated by susceptibility testing. Recommendations. Hemodialysis often leads to elimination of most tuberculosis drugs. Medications are usually given after dialysis better. There are paucity of data regarding elimination of drugs in CFD, so it is not uh, yet able to mention the drugs which are we usually can use usually, but in case of hemodialysis patients, better to give the drugs after the hemodialysis patient. Careful monitoring of patients is essential and side effects mainly neuropsychiatric problems, hepatitis and optic neuro neuropathy may develop are noted in occur as higher levels in patients with renal failure and especially those on dialysis. Therapeutic drug monitoring is indicated regarding gentamicin as well as this uh, aminoglycosides. Monitoring is essential. Treatment of TB patients with mild renal impairment and with glomerular filtration rate J430 to 60 ml should be individualized standard. Ethambutol is used to prevent the emergence of systemic kidney resistance which isonized resistance isolates. All but first line drug must only be used after discussion with a consultation physician ex experience in treating the TB or with regional tuberculosis control center. Patients with CKD not on dialysis. Patients with CKD stages 4 and 5 dosing intervals should be increased to three times weekly for ethambutol, pyrazinamide and aminoglycosides. For patients on hemodialysis, the dosing intervals should be increased three times weekly to reduce the risk of drug accumulation or toxicity. Treatment can be given immediately after dialysis to avoid premature drug removal with this strategy. There is possible risk of raised drug levels of ethambutol plus pyrazinamide between dialysis. Renal allograft recipients, modified treatment regimen is recommended for renal allograft recipient with adjusted dose of isonized ethambutol for 18 months combined with ofloxacin 200 mg twice daily for the first 9 months and parazinamide 750 mg twice daily for the first 3 months. Rifampicin should be avoided in patients receiving CNI because enzyme induction will make it more difficult to maintain adequate CNI blood levels. Chemoprophylaxis. 6 months of INS 300 mg plus pyridoxin 10 to 25 mg daily or INS plus rifampicin plus pyridoxin for 3 months or rifampicin alone for 4 to 6 months. There is no evidence to support chemoprophylaxis for regimen longer than 6 months to isoniazid alone or 3 months INS plus rifampicin or 4 months only with rifampicin alone. Chemoprophylaxis can be given. Uh, these are the drugs we are using uh, regarding the management of the ESRD patients according to the GFL level 30 to 60, 10 to 20 and less than 30 ml. In case of rifampicin isoniazide, uh, the 30 to 60, there is no need of just dose adjustment and uh, at the level of the up to isoniazide rifampicin at no level there is no need of any dose adjustment. But in case of ethambutol and pyrazinamat needs dose adjustment. 
Patients with ESRD have a substantially higher TB incidence rates than mortalities occurred and general population TB patients. More, nine, more than 90% of patients among ESRD patients occurred among non-US born persons. Transmission of TB was rare in published contact investigations. No reports secondary to TB because exposure to index case patients and few reports of TB infection documented. Prevention of TB and dialysis facilities requires screening ESRD patients at the highest risk of TB exposure, especially US born persons, as well as treatment and targeted education regarding the importance of uh, LTBI, treatment among persons diagnosing the LTBI. Factors uh, focusing TB prevention efforts on screening ESRD patients, highest risk of TB exposure upon entry to a dialysis facilities through use of IGRA and uh, increasing the LTBI regimens like INI, INH and RPT plus rifampicin may an effective strategy for reducing the burdens of the TB all over the world. Thank you very much for your kind patience and hearing. Thank you very much.